Kenton, Kenton is going to start us off. Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming to the submarine groundwater discharge uh, session. So the point of this session is to kind of bring this community together to show and kind of think about how SDG are important for uh, the elemental cycle in the ocean, especially carbon and TEI. And where we want to start is this amazing picture here showing the thermal signature of the groundwater coming out. A nighttime picture, so the surface is uh, cooler and we have the hot uh, groundwater coming in and we can see that signature. But that is an idealized situation. In theory, we cannot really see SDG. And that's why it hasn't been till mid-90s when we had that Rama and Moore paper showing that SDG is really important to elemental cycle and budget in the ocean. So when we think about it in context of river, we can see the rivers are all out there. We can see the discharge. There are most of them, not all, are gauged uh, to a certain extent. We have chemical analysis done at these gauged rivers. So we have a better understanding of the river fluxes into the ocean and how they're impacting the global budget. But going back to that last picture, we really do not see SDG, and that makes it harder. So what are we talking about when we are talking about SDG or submarine groundwater? So submarine groundwater, uh, most of the time we think of this fresh groundwater that is coming out and basically emptying the aquifer is emptying into the coastal ocean. But over the years, as work has progressed, there have been few ideas that came out which, are, which makes it even more interesting and harder to look at. First of all, if you look at these figures, they are double arrowed, which means it's not a one-directional flow. We have, depending on the tide, the meteorological forcing, and the hydrogeology, we can have salt water from the ocean coming in, recirculating, picking up elements, and going back out. Or, depending on the meteorology and hydrological condition, it could be just fresh water coming in. So that makes it harder to actually get an understanding of the budget from these SDGs. And the other important thing that came up, and we'll be hearing about it in today's uh, plenary talks, is the scale. So initially, people thought this is, a, this is a dispersed point source that is happening near shore. But here we can see that that is not always the case. Here the scale is 100 kilometers, and we're talking about groundwater coming out almost 100 kilometers offshore, not just at the edge. And that makes it also a very important uh, pathway to look at. So how does it look like? So this is a con continental US model estimate. This is not all measured estimate, kind of showing you the scale of uh, submarine groundwater discharge we're talking about. We can see it's pretty ambiguous. It's all over the place. Uh, and we scale this a little bit. Right? We can start at looking at the modeled combined with observational data showing this SDG on a global scale. And again, it's everywhere. Some of them are hot spots. Some of them are more dispersed, but there's a lot of SDG that is coming out. But the downside of this map is it doesn't capture the whole process because it's a snapshot. And SDG, as I said, it's a really complex process driven by hydrological, geological, and meteorological forcing. So that makes it difficult to come up with a budget. Or for the fact, how do we even identify SDG when you're out there? So there have been a lot of traces that we need to use to figure out SDG. We're going to hear about them in today's talk and how they're done. But I just wanted to point out to one um, tracer that has been used very successfully, radium-228, which has a half-life of five years. I know most of you are not interested in radium, except maybe a few of us here. Uh, but there is a reason for this. The beauty about radium is radium comes out both from groundwater and river. They're highly enriched, which means it's a natural source of these processes. And you can compare apples to apples, river versus SDG, on the same tracer. And the take home from this is, doing this mass balance, what uh, Kim et al. found was that the SDG was about two to three times contributing to the radium budget than the river budget. So what does that mean for other elemental input into the ocean, including iron and nutrient and phosphate that is coming in? And so for that part, I'm going to hand it over to <coughs> Shelley. Right. So uh, with radium, you get an estimate of your water flux. So once you get that estimate of your water flux, you can take uh, your concentration data, 
and multiply it by your water flux, and you start to get a picture of how much, here we're focusing on nutrients, uh, DIN and uh, phosphate. <clears throat> well, once you get the water flux and the concentration, multiply it together, now you get an input vector for phosphorus and nitrate. So this is just, again, one snapshot where uh, the width of, or the diameter of your circles is related to the magnitude of your flux. So the higher the di diameter, the greater the flux. And uh, we can start to get a picture of just where some of these larger inputs to the ocean are um, from SGD. But I want to also point out uh, that there are a lot of areas where we just don't have data. And it's not because SGD isn't important there, it's because we don't have infrastructure there. Or, uh, related to the Arctic, we might have had a presumption that because everything is frozen, you actually don't have any groundwater flow. And we're gonna have a talk about how that uh, assumption may not, well, is not true, especially in a warming Arctic. <clears throat> so when you uh, combine all of these together, we can start uh, thinking about, well, how, what are the inputs? Uh, for example, dissolved silicate from rivers compared to SGD? phosphate from rivers compared to SGD, and then uh, nitrate or DIN uh, <clears throat> from rivers compared to SGD. And just broadly writ, um, inputs of these macronutrients are anywhere from 60 to about 170 times greater, times percent greater from uh, SGD than rivers. So for some of them, they're, they're bigger input. And these are conservative estimates. You can go read the paper and see um, how they try to really be conservative with their estimates. So, so this is a really critical parameter. At least for silicate, it's the second largest vector outside of uh, hydrothermal vents to uh, the ocean. But it's not just macronutrients. <clears throat> they also will impact uh, trace element budgets and micronutrients. So just in this region alone, the reactive iron flux <clears throat> represents 10% of the soluble atmospheric iron flux to the South Atlantic Ocean. Just from this uh, coastline right there. We are seeing some of the societal impacts also of SGD. Did, it, does, did anyone read this article? How the hydrologist should be happy. Do you know what this is related to? Uh, it's a Supreme Court decision from 2019, uh, where <clears throat> the Supreme Court acknowledged that these diffuse non-point sources of groundwater inputs to the coastal region from untreated sewage was actually impacting uh, the coastal ecosystem. So there are a lot of societal consequences to this when you're thinking about uh, fisheries management or ecosystem-based fisheries management. <clears throat> so I wanted to bring that uh, to your attention as well. So we have a number of talks today. We have five. <clears throat> Joseph Tamborski is going to start us out with a primer for OCB. We just talk about the different drivers for SGD and uh, some of the different controls on SGD. Dr. Niels Moosdorf is going to talk about uh, the controls and the scale of freshwater fluxes. You know, are you very near shore? Is it a one kilometer scale? Is it a longer scale? What controls that flux? Greg Conley is going to take us to the Arctic. We're going to look at uh, groundwater and impacts on carbon cycling and the seasonality of uh, groundwater fluxes there. <clears throat> Dr. Megan Eagle is then going to take us to carbon cycling and subterranean estuaries broadly with some case studies and how do we distinguish sources uh, and source signatures and how does that relate to uh, your carbon budgets? And finally, Dr. Alicia Wilson, who's also the 2023 uh, Darcy Distinguished Lecturer is going to bring us back, you know, un bring us back out and talk about global scales of sailing groundwater, but also offshore discharge. So maybe not just in the uh, coastal zone, um, but on the shelf as well. So I am going to turn it over to our first two speakers who are uh, joining us virtually, and then we're going to continue. Thanks. <laughs> And thank you all for having me. 
My name is Joe Tamborski. I'm at Old Dominion University. I'm truly sorry that I can't be there in person to give this talk to you all in chat, but please, please, please reach out uh, with any questions, comments, ideas that you might have. I love talking about SGD and I'm really honored to be talking with you today. The data that I'll show you this morning would not be possible without a team of support behind it from Stony Brook, Cooey, and Dalhousie, and my own students now at ODU. So thanks to them and the, the funding sources that provided this work. So I love to start my SGD talks with this aerial photograph of the coastal zone. I think this really well exemplifies all the things that we can see with the naked eye. We can see rivers that drain land and bring new water and materials to the ocean. We can see the prevalence of coastal wetlands. And we can see the channels and their ditches that drain and bring material to the ocean. We can see the impact of urbanization within the coastal watershed. If we look carefully, we might even be able to see harmful algal blooms that are developing in the estuary. The things that we cannot see with the naked eye, especially at this regional scale, is this submarine groundwater discharge phenomenon. And that's the focus of today's session. So if you do look carefully, you can see that coastal communities have known about the presence of groundwater seeps for thousands of years. Some have relied on this seepage as a source of drinking water. You can also see this phenomena in uh, wetlands. So here's an example from the Plum Island LTER. What you'll see and perhaps hear is this salty reducing pore water that's draining out of macro pores of this very fine grained organic rich marsh peat. The white here is sulfide oxidizing bacteria. So this is absolutely water you do not want to drink, but both of these flow paths fall within our very broad definition of submarine groundwater discharge. So here we have the flow of water through continental and insular margins from the seabed to the coastal ocean, regardless of the fluid's composition or driving force. It's this last part that's really critical to our definition here. As hydrologists and hydrogeologists have long defined groundwater as any water within the saturated zone of a geologic material, such that we can have this fresh drinking water as well as that salty reducing water or even brines encompassed within our definition of SGD. So you'll hear today and you'll hear as you speak with uh, researchers here, make this designation between a fresh flow path or a terrestrial submarine groundwater discharge signature and a saline or a marine SGD signature. And that's designed to disentangle these flow paths. Uh, note that our SGD, SGD definition here does not include low temperature hydrothermal or venting systems. We need to put our, con our SGD definition in context of pore water drainage or pore water exchange, or I'll refer to as PEX here. This is simply the advection of pore fluids, which are generally saline, over shorter spatial and temporal scales. So here we have an arbitrary meter and hour designation here, but essentially this definition has been put forward to exclude processes driven by critters, by bioirrigation, by bioturbation, or other short scale processes driven by pressure differentials to that of our longer spatial and longer temporal groundwater scale processes. So what does that look like? Here's a space or time plot. So we have vertical scale on the y-axis and temporal scale on the x-axis. Notice our pore water exchange designation here is less than scales of meters or less than time scales of hours. And there's a lot to unpack in this diagram. We have a lot of overlapping drivers here. This talk and subsequent talks, we'll start to unpack some of these different drivers. But I want to emphasize that there is overlap, but there is distinction between different pathways, for example, tidal pumping versus 
uh, hydraulic gradients. And so you might imagine then that each of these different drivers and flow paths will have a unique biogeochemical signature in the subsurface. So we're going to come back to this space for time plot later. In order to disentangle these flow paths and begin thinking about differences in biogeochemistry, we need to be thinking in cross-section or perhaps even in three dimensions. So here we have a cross-section of a coastal unconfined aquifer. Unconfined meaning that the aquifer has a free connection with the overlying land surface. So we have rainfall that can soak into soils and recharge the aquifer or raise the water table. And it's this fresh groundwater on the left-hand side of this diagram that is a new source of water to the ocean, much like a river would be. And that will carry with it new nutrients that perhaps reflects the overlying land use of the watershed. And that can bring in new carbon, for example, through the weathering of silicate or carbonate minerals in the aquifer. On the right-hand side of this diagram, we have the seawater circulation or this saline SGD. So again, as, as Kenshin noted, these are uh, multi-directional arrows. So water comes in and water comes out. That means it's a net zero source of water, or a recycled source of water, but this can potentially become a new source of nutrients or carbon through some combination of or organic matter remineralization, or again, for silicate and carbonate mineral weathering in the subsurface. And so what drives this? We have different types of flow. We have that unconfined aquifer, but we also have deeper confined aquifers. And I want you to think of two types of flow that dominate in these coastal systems, uh, springs or point sources. Point source would be like a river and diffuse or non-point source seepage. So here we have a thermal infrared image of a point source spring along the coast of Hawaii. This really spreads out to a massive area of influence in the coastal ocean. And here we have for the North Shore of Long Island, a glacial till dominated pathology. We have a cold temperature anomaly along much of the shoreline spanning hundreds of meters. So there's no discernible input source here. So the geology here is controlling the types of flow that we may have. But how do we get this brackish or fresh groundwater delivery to the ocean? Well, in order to disentangle biogeochemistry, I think it's really important we first understand what drives groundwater here. And so the fundamental mechanism that drives fresh groundwater to the ocean is the terrestrial hydraulic gradient. Really simply, this is where we have a higher elevation water table than that of sea level. So this elevation difference will drive water flow down gradient in the subsurface. Now, this is a process that's modulated by the tide. So as we go from high tide to low tide, we enhance the elevation difference between the water table and sea level such that near shore coastal studies tend to observe higher rates of SGD at low tide as this hydraulic gradient is maximized and lower rates at high tide when this hydraulic gradient is suppressed. Other driving mechanisms include wave setup and tidal pumping. This is like a conveyor belt that drives seawater or surface waters into permeable sediments. I like to think of it as uh, if we take a sandy beach at high tide, seawater will infiltrate and recharge that beach. But at low tide or sometime thereafter, that water must drain or exfiltrate back out of the beach. But it comes back out with a likely modified by geochemical signature. To emphasize that point here, I'm showing you a cross section of a coastal aquifer. These are well points from high tide to intertidal and low tide positions. And you see salinity contours of those fluids from saline to brackish here in the intertidal zone to fresh. And these radionuclide derived residence times are on the order of several days in the intertidal zone here. So that's sufficient time to allow for remineralization processes or weathering of sediments. So you can imagine that that fluid, when it comes back out, comes back out with a new signature. Another important Mechanism that drives SGD is density dispersion. Here I'm showing you two different numerical modeling simulations by Claire Robinson. They're both fundamentally the same aside from the slope of the beach and the properties of the sediment. Here's that tidal and wave recirculation cell and you can have here fresh groundwater in blue flowing to the ocean. And notice here on either side, you have this saline water that recharges the sediments, but these vectors are not unidirectional. 
So there's recharge, but then there is net exfiltration or discharge along this density driven boundary. And these interfaces, they vary with time, they vary with the seasons. So during the wet season, our water table will be at a higher position and our freshwater saltwater interface will be pushed seaward. Now, during the dry season or in response perhaps to over pumping of an aquifer and wells, the water table will drop and this freshwater saltwater interface will migrate landward. And so this seasonal migration can result in the displacement of volumetrically large contributions of brackish and saline groundwater to the coastal ocean. So all of this is true at the nearshore scale. Here's our tidal recirculation cell. Here's our density driven mixing zone. But we can zoom out here to the embayment scale. So think of Chesapeake Bay or the Long Island Sound, for example, where we have some kind of confining unit like clay that separates the unconfined aquifer here from a deeper confined aquifer. And in this cartoon, the confined aquifer outcrops at some distance offshore of the embayment. And we can zoom out even farther to the scale of the continental shelf. And now we have a proverbial layer cake of confined aquifers. And if we're in the right location and if we're deep enough, for example, in Florida, we may have additional flow driven by geothermal heating. So in this cartoon, all of these deeper confined aquifers outcrop where there's the saline groundwater, but that is uh, not a rule necessarily. We do know through mapping of paleo aquifers from electrical resistivity surveys and through IODP expeditions that we have these paleo aquifers that persist along much of the continental shelf in response to recharge from the last glacial maximum. So these yellow dots represent wells where the pore water fluids had salinity less than 15 parts per thousand. And so this conceptual diagram is that there's actually onshore offshore connectivity of fluids in part controlled by geologic structures, by confining units, by clinoforms and faults. So there is a geologic control on both the water flux where it's occurring and by extension, how carbon and how nutrients are transformed at such a scale. To emphasize this onshore offshore connectivity, I'm pulling this plot from Billy Moore and Samantha Joy, where they collected uh, IODP data from the New Jersey continental shelf, and they're plotting here ammonium content as a function of delta sulfate. So this is simply the amount of sulfate that's reduced compared to what you expect to have from measured chloride content of those pore waters. And we can see that the a uh, vast majority of these IODP pore waters have C to N ratios that more closely track a terrestrial source rather than a marine redfield type ratio. And so there's this processing of redox species of organic matter in the subterranean estuary here. We have this onshore offshore connectivity. So what is the subterranean estuary? Well, let's start with our textbook definition of an estuary, right? We have a semi-enclosed coastal body of water with a free connection to the sea, where we have dilution from fresh water derived from the drainage of waters from land. Billy Moore defines the subterranean estuary here as a coastal aquifer where groundwater derived from land drainage measurably dilutes seawater that's invaded the aquifer through a free connection to the sea. I wanna emphasize that in an estuary, we're talking about particle concentrations on the order of milligrams per liter. But in the subterranean estuary, we're talking about porosity of 0.2 to 0.6. So we're talking about more equal proportions of water to sediment, such that this higher degree of water particle interaction will facilitate greater weathering, potentially. And we're talking about longer fluid residence times. And so despite the name of the estuary, the STE is in fact a zone of perhaps more importantly, sharp redox gradients in addition to salinity pH and oxygen. So how do we measure something that we can't see that occurs over a super broad area with multiple overlapping flow paths, right? This has been the challenge of the decades. I promised we'd come back to this space for time plot. Here's our PEX versus our SGD, but now we've superimposed here different measurement techniques. So we have a suite of geochemical and geophysical techniques. We've covered a few of them. I don't have time to get through all of them, but we will do these three that I've highlighted in yellow. 
I'm happy to answer questions about these other processes. The only tool that we have to actually physically collect and sample the biogeochemistry of the fluids are called seepage meters. In this case, it's simply the top of a 55 gallon steel drum that's inserted into the sediments. It's retrofit with some kind of collection port and bag and requires a diver or a user to physically change out that bag and collect the seeping fluids. So as you might imagine, this is an incredibly time and labor intensive approach. And these meters reflect measurements at a single point in space and time. So there's uh, some caveats to it, but it is the only approach that we have to actually collect water that's exiting the sediment water interface. And so to help overcome some of that uh, challenge in space and time, a lot of researchers use radionuclides as Kanchen and Shoyli introduced. And this was popularized by Billy Moore in the late 90s, where he demonstrated large scale enrichments of radium-226. This is a radioisotope with a 1600 year half-life. This large scale enrichment within the 30 kilometers or so along the South Atlantic bite compared to open Atlantic activities. And through a mass balance, Billy demonstrated that this was an SGD flux on the order of 40% of the riverine flux to the region. This number has since been revised and Alicia Wilson will talk more about this area this afternoon. But this study really set off a chain reaction to investigate SGD at such a scale and to use these tracers for quantifying SGD inputs. So really this boils down to simple uh, mass balance approaches in the coastal zone or along the continental shelf or global ocean, where we attempt to quantify known inputs from rivers and streams, inputs from sediments, and then losses from things like mixing or radioactive decay. But this is made possible because of the uranium and thorium decay series. So we have trace quantities of these isotopes in our minerals. And so the thorium in those sediments decays to four different radium isotopes with half-lives of 11 days, three days, five years, and 1600 years. So we have a range of half-lives that enable us to trace different spatial temporal scale processes. We also have radon-222, a noble gas with a half-life of 3.8 days. So Generally speaking, these are not taken up by biological processes and they behave conservatively once in the marine environment aside from decay. They are produced in groundwaters, uh, principally through alpha recoil of their parent thorium nuclide in addition to desorption or weathering processes. And so these radionuclides are enriched in our submarine groundwaters by orders of magnitude over that of typical oceanic and estuarine waters. Radium is not without its own flaws, so it is a particle reactive element and will stick to particles at low salinities. Here I'm showing you a plot of the uh, distribution coefficient or retardation coefficient of radium as a function of either the flow path length in the subsurface or the transit time of that particular flow path. So it's our short-lived radium isotopes that we can use to trace these short scale processes like PEX or like intertidal seawater circulation. All of the radium isotopes can be used to trace, in theory, these longer spatial temporal scale processes. The difference here is simply a difference of the ingrowth time of the long-lived radionuclides that cannot be captured by these shorter time scale processes. And so these radioisotopes can be used fundamentally in two distinct ways to trace SGD. One would be through a time series approach here. So here you see a spring and a neap tidal cycle of a coastal wetland. And we have depth here, or water level. And so as the water level here decreases, you can see this nice increase of the radon activity. That's simply the modification of that terrestrial hydraulic gradient. And accompanying with that radon increase here, we see an increase of CO2 and to a lesser extent, an increase of methane. So radon is a great tool in that it's often paired like in this situation with greenhouse gas analyzers. And here you can also see discrete bottle measurements of DIC and of DOC. Radon can also be used in a surveying approach. So here would be a steady state snapshot of the radon distribution. This is work from my graduate student, Moira Taylor, for the Peconic Estuary on the east end of Long Island. And we can see lots of low radon for much of the Peconic shoreline, but we do see some radon hotspots that we can then use this information to dive in and expand upon our field surveys work 
integrate this activity to do this mass balance approach. And I'll end on these two slides for radium that we can also use it in addition to the shelf investigations, but as end member mixing models. So here's a case where we do this over a discrete tidal cycle. And we set up these mixing models that differentiates now activity ratios of radium from brackish groundwater fluids to marsh or wetland pore waters and the coastal ocean. So we can separate out these different flow paths over these discrete time intervals over the course of an estuary at a discrete point in time. And to end at the embayment scale, as we're continuing to think about scale here, is an application from Long Island Sound where we have these symbols as surface and bottom waters. And I'm showing you the distribution of the radium-228 isotope here. Here are our groundwaters in the black X's. And you can see, again, orders of magnitude enrichment. And I just want to highlight the bottom waters collected throughout Long Island Sound in summer 2010 here, which show a really clear strong enrichment of this five-year half-life isotope with decreasing salinity. So we have a brackish radium-enriched source. This is likely a confined aquifer that's outcropping in Long Island Sound here. And through mass balance approaches, we can say that this water flux is anywhere from 50 to 200% of the water flux of the Connecticut River, the largest river that drains into this system. But from numerical modeling exercises, we know that the fresh groundwater contribution can only be a few percent of the total. So I hope you take away from this uh, that we have a lot of flow paths. We have a lot of driving mechanisms. There's overlap between these flow paths and they might have different biogeochemical signatures. To understand the biogeochemistry, we first need to understand the geology and the flow. So we need to consider scale. We need to consider temporal variability. And I'll leave this slide up. I think this is something we can discuss with the panel, but how do we further disentangle flow paths? How do we look to these understudied regions as Shirley and Kenshin alluded to? And how do we think about these systems in response to changes in sea level? So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Hi, Joe. Um, this is Julia Moriarty from University of Colorado. Um, thanks for a great talk. Um, I was curious about how you mentioned that both um, submarine groundwater discharge as well as river discharge are enriched in radium. And I was wondering how you separate some of that out if you're measuring concentrations of radon. Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, you know, the rivers, they carry two different loads of radium. They carry a naturally dissolved load, and then they carry a desorbed load where there's radium release once that fresh water carrying particles enters the more saline waters of the estuary. And so. In an ideal world, there's a difference of the radium activity ratio between the rivers or the groundwater. I say ideal because that's not always the case. It's lithology dependent. Um, but we have an easier time constraining rivers because most of them are gauged. So we can determine the flux of radium compared to the flux of the, the source we don't know, which is the SGD. I, this is Nikako from University of Hawaii. Um, that was a really great uh, overview, and I appreciate things that I didn't know before that. Um, I'm wondering, are there longer timescale approaches to figure out changes in groundwater over a thousand year timescales or longer? Are there ways to reconstruct this that require short lived isotopes? If I'm hearing, uh, the question is about timescales, longer timescales. And, and yes, that's really where we would rely on the numerical modeling approaches to look into the um, longer term, say, glacial or interglacial cycle effects on SGD. Hi, uh, Julie Granger, UConn. Enjoyed your talk. Um, I'd, I was wondering if you could comment on net sources versus reco recycled sources. As an oceanographer, I'm interested into in nitrogen and new sources of nitrogen coming to the system. So if I were to take, say, a slightly saline uh, groundwater coming into my system, take the concentration, the radium, and multiply it, I would erroneously probably think of it as a new source, but part of that could be recycled from my seawater. So as a naive reader of groundwater literature, how do I navigate this? 
Yeah, this is a, a, a fantastic question. So we'll, we'll separate this out by the fresh groundwater contribution first and then the, the saline. So in terms of the fresh groundwater, we need to think about whether nitrogen, let's say delivered from an anthropogenic source, fertilizer, septic waste, right? Is that being modified through the subterranean estuary as it approaches the ocean? So there could be denitrification or other processes that act to remove that, or we may have processes nitrification that we can actually enhance, right? But if we focus on just the saline groundwater, which I think is really the crux of your question to this new nitrogen, I suppose it depends on time scales of what we're considering. So a lot of this is organic matter remineralization, but not necessarily. And in terms of how we disentangle that, it comes back to the time scales that we're thinking about. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I have an online question from Damian Leonardo. Great talk, wondering whether you're aware of any efforts on continuous monitoring of radon to capture seasonality um, as opposed to campaign-based measurements. Uh, yes, there are a few groups, uh, Hawaii and Sweden, who do more routine monitoring. And this would be really something I'd like the community to push forward, especially eutrophic estuaries where we know that this is a problem, is to make this more of a routine monitoring effort. Right? We have rivers that are gauged by the USGS, and we have real-time flow and nutrient data available to look at sources or flux. And so for those impaired waterways, I think this is a next step forward to do this uh, with these systems. Any, any other questions? Yeah, if not, uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you. Uh, we have our next speaker online, uh, also joining us virtually, Dr. Niels Moosdorf. Niels, are you ready? I am. I hope you can hear me and see my screen. <laughs> thanks for having me. Um, and thanks first, Joe, for the excellent introduction. Um, I will use a lot of the terms that you introduced. Um, it was really fun to see. Um, so yeah, my name is Nils Moosdorf. I'm sitting in Bremen in Germany. I would love to be there in person, but unfortunately it wasn't possible. So I have to contribute virtually and hope you are having a good workshop. Um, and I would like to talk about large scale controls and small scale effects of fresh submarine groundwater discharge. This is that fraction that Joe mentioned that's not recirculated, um, but just the terrestrial groundwater coming in. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the actual water bubbling out into the ocean is fresh. It could be brackish, but then that's basically the fresh groundwater discharge would be um, the fraction of it that was fresh. And same as with Joe, also for me, um, what I'm presenting is the work of a lot of people. Um, and I'm just standing or sitting here as the face of it, but um, it's actually not just my talk, but of those who did the actual research that I'm talking about. And I also have my favorite photo or picture to, to start with. Um, if I talk about groundwater discharge, and this is basically it, you see my research group a few years back looking for submarine groundwater discharge in the German Warden Sea. Um, and as mentioned, it's difficult to spot, but at the time, Till Oehler, postdoc in my group, um, had an excellent eye and found the submarine groundwater discharge site, or one of them that we were looking for, and it looks like this. So it's basically a small, that would be a few inches, um, large water bubbling into, into the sea. And that's already, we were really happy finding it, and we found quite some of them. But that, I think, already shows the, the, the issue nicely. Because yes, we might be able to measure the amount of water that goes in here with a seepage meter, for instance. But then how many of those springs, and that would be like a submarine spring, even if it's a power sediment, how many of those springs actually are in the stretch of coast that you can see on the other picture? It's hard to quantify. 
um, even at this local or regional scale. But I'm going to talk mostly about the global scale here, and there you can basically um, not use this. But where actually where on Earth is fresh STD occurring? And the answer, the simplified answer is everywhere. The more differentiated answer would be along most of the coastline, because it's kind of the standard mode. You've seen it, groundwater follows, terrestrial groundwater follows gravity. So that means it flows towards the ocean, if it can. So it's not a question of, or not so much about where it does it occur, but how much occurs on my stretch of coast. This how much can include zero, because if the if the conditions are such as that there is no groundwater flowing, then maybe it will not flow. But the standard case I would say is that groundwater flows towards the coast, and you have a diffuse input along all the coastlines of groundwater discharge, more or less, of course. Um, rivers, they're usually used as comparison against fresh groundwater discharge, obviously, because those are the two major terrestrial sources of water to the oceans. Rivers are point sources, looking at a, from a coastal perspective. Um, they just enter the ocean at one point, but the groundwater actually is a kind of a diffuse source along all the coastlines. I will also be, I will be talking about importance a little bit in the future, um, but there is places, whenever you don't have a river, then the groundwater influence can be very high because there's just no river influence. But when we talk about a coastal process, we also have to think about, okay, what is our coast? What do we define as coast? And how long is that coast? And that's actually a nice question that has been talked about a few decades ago um, by a guy called Benoit Mandelbrot. Um, he, he, is, um, he was known for his fractal paintings, and the coastline is a fractal problem. So the, the, the closer you zoom in, the longer your coast gets. And this is not relevant for many of the, for many applications if you work on terrestrial areas or maybe also in the open ocean. But when you work exactly as the coast, at the coast, as many of the SGD people do, that really becomes relevant. And that's an issue because it's not necessarily comparable what one person does against the others. So, but that's just a side effect. The, the idea is to ask, what's the volume of fresh groundwater discharge globally? How can we find that out? I think there's two, uh, no, three, sorry. There's three main possibilities that we have. We could use water budgets. It's, it's quite common um, from, the, from the hydrogeology side to talk about water budgets. So we know precipitation, that's the amount of water that comes in minus evapotranspiration. That would be the amount of water that goes directly back to the atmosphere. We know the amount of surface runoff. And if we assume the amount of groundwater to stay the same, then we would basically know from, the, from that budget, we could estimate the amount of submarine groundwater discharge. It's the missing, the missing value. But the issue here is that the uncertainties of all the other values that I just talked about are so big that it honestly doesn't really work out because the volume of submarine groundwater discharge that we expect is within the uncertainty of the other values. So the budgets really don't work out from my perspective. We could upscale observations. Um, I just saw you, I just showed you some observational data or some of some of the observation points. We could just take a lot of observations. They measured using, for instance, radium, but also seepage meters. They measured the amount of SGD at one place. If we take a lot of those places, we maybe can just upscale it to the global scale. But there's two issues with that. Why also I won't show that? Because if you, if, you, if you look at the observations, you need an area that they are representative for. And this area or this stretch of coastline needs to be defined by kind of a catchment or by something. It needs to be, represent something. And we don't know the catchments of these observations. And we also um, observe submarine groundwater discharge. Usually, we do those studies where we can see it or where we assume it's there. There's honestly very few publications publishing that there's no SGD here and that they would be mentioned under the keywords of SGD. So 
many observations are biased towards high submarine groundwater discharge, and we don't know their contributing areas. So I don't think that works. So we are really bound at this point towards models, because also remote sensing doesn't really work as far as, I, as I'm concerned. We, it, it's beautiful at the regional scale, but globally, we do, just don't have the resolution we need. So we are bound to models. What's the basis of models? It's data. So we can model what we have global data for. One of the main data sets that we need, it's just a small excursion in that direction, is permeability. Um, Joe mentioned that groundwater goes seawards following the hydraulic gradient. That hydraulic gradient is important, but then the ability of, or the, the attribute of rock, how well water can flow through it, that's permeability or hydraulic conductivity, I use them interchangeably. Um, this is um, the main factor. And we have done a global permeability map a few years back that can be used as a basis for terrestrial studies. It's based on a global lithology map. So it basically translates rock type into a permeability. A sandstone would get a certain permeability. Um, we can do calculations with that, but it's obviously very simplified. And it's also not really representing the coast. Um, because this small, at the, imagine the coast, a small stretch of sand, a beach, will have a big impact on the coastal water flows versus if there was no beach or even a concrete wall, like in a harbor. So we need to represent that somehow. So we just um, produced a new data set that actually focuses on coastal permeability, where we would differentiate between landward permeability, shoreline permeability, and seaward, like the immediate seafloor permeability. It's just a revision. I should be, I should be doing um, the revisions anytime, but I actually didn't get to it yet. But with that, we can actually represent the coastal permeability much better than that original data set. And our coast, by the way, is about two, two million kilometers long, um, which is a fairly long, a fairly detailed coast with many small islands on there that are usually not there. So, but back to the model. How, how can we model fresh SGD? Um, that was basically Elko Leyendijk's idea. It's a really um, simplified approach. So, we took um, numerical models of groundwater flow and groundwater discharge. What you're seeing here on this figure is a 2D model of a coastal catchment. It shows an aquifer that's 100 meter thick, homogeneous, and we model the groundwater discharge based on different slope or based different hydraulic gradient, different recharge, and different permeability. And for all kinds of different combinations of those three parameters, so high slope, high recharge, and high permeability versus low slope, low recharge, and low permeability, and everything in between, we calculated 350 models of those generic combinations. And then we took a data set of 40,000 coastal catchments that we had, got their actual parameters of slope, recharge, and permeability, and could then interpolate from the individual models. Looks like that. So basically you see here, the higher the permeability, um, whoop, trying to use the laser pointer, the higher the permeability, the higher the groundwater discharge. So the more blue the figure gets. Also, the higher the topographic gradient, the higher the groundwater discharge, but just for certain permeabilities. If the permeability is really high, the topographic gradient doesn't really play a role anymore. It's always high groundwater discharge. If the permeability is low, it's the other way around. So that's kind of the way to read this. But if we apply it to the global scale, we come up with these model results. Um, so we see here, the bluer, the more fresh SGD for 40,000 coastal catchments. You saw that before. Um, and the numbers add up to about 0.1%, oh no, to about less than 1%, sorry, not 0.1, but less than 1% of river discharge. River discharge, again, the natural comparison. So that's not a lot. 
But if you look at it a bit more spatially, then for instance, about half of the global SGD, fresh SGD, stems from the area from plus to minus 10 degrees latitude around the equator. So tropical areas really have lots of SGD compared to other areas because there's islands there, there's long coastlines, and there's an intensive hydrology there, and there is high, there are high permeabilities in volcanic rocks. So all these contribute to hotspot situations, but while at the global scale, SGD may not be such a huge water volume, volume it can be relevant at the regional scale, definitely. So what does this water flux now do to ocean chemistry? For that, um, Kim Mayfield and we actually took samples and analyzed samples of different elements from coastal areas, from different types of rocks. So extrusive rocks, intrusive rocks, sedimentary and carbonate rocks, and basically could use this classification to extrapolate the contents and the concentrations that we saw um, to those coasts. What comes out of that? And I'm really sorry it's a table, but I had no idea how to better put it up. For those elements, lithium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium, we could estimate the amount of or the percentage that enters through SGD versus rivers. So 10% of the magnesium flux comes from SGD. And the delta 26 of magnesium is quite different between SGD and rivers. And if I weigh that and I produce a weighted average value, it would be different from the, from the river inputs. Not so much, not hugely, but it would be. So this is just so if you are really doing very sophisticated and detailed analysis of those isotopic ratios, you might want to think about that rivers actually are not your only input to the marine system. That's the message here, but the concentrations themselves will not be hugely different, but the isotopic compositions could be. For nutrient fluxes, it looks a bit similar. So again, we took a lot of coastal data. This is thousands of data of coastal uh, of concentration of nutrient concentrations in coastal waters and extrapolated them using the water flux that we got from the previous model. <clears throat> and then you could see, and that was differentiated, river flux, total SGD flux, the only time I'm going to talk about the recirculated SGD2 and not just the fresh SGD and fresh SGD flux. And you see that for DIN, DON, and DIP, rivers have much higher fluxes than the fresh SGD. Fresh SGD fluxes are fairly low compared to river fluxes. If you look at the global scale, um, that, that's different for the recirculated SGD, as you have seen before too. So if you include all sources of water, all salinities, you get to higher fluxes than rivers. But then we just shortly had this discussion. It's a question about, are those actually new nutrients or are they, re or are they recycled? So that's a different story. But the fresh SGD nutrient in inputs are not so huge at the global scale. That doesn't mean that locally they can't be really dominant, but globally they are not huge. Um, but if we look at those nutrient fluxes, again, you've seen this graphic, a lot of different samples they have often a different nutrient composition than river water. Here in this plot, you see DIN versus DIP and DIN versus DSI. The white dots would be rivers and the black dots are SGD samples. So the groundwater discharge has a tendency to be silicon rich and nitrogen rich because silicon is being dissolved from weathering in the groundwater all the time and nitrogen is much more mobile in groundwater than phosphorus. Usually phosphorus gets adsorbed to particles in groundwater and is not transported that much. So if you have a groundwater dominant system or groundwater inputs domi dominating, then you could actually end up with a phosphorus limitation where before you would have a nitrogen limitation. <clears throat> 
So that's the story here. Now that's the global scale. If we stay there, but look a little bit into the details of the regional scale again, then we end up at this map, which where we try to estimate regional eutrophication based on the global numbers. So this takes this global water flow, water flux model that I showed you and adds nutrient concentrations in a very simplified way again and compares that against different ecosystems. So we have estuaries, salt marshes, and coral reefs. So all these orange areas would be coral reefs that are, according to this model, at high risk of eutrophication due to groundwater discharge because um, I think more than 20% of the nutrients um, that are added there are from groundwater discharge compared to rivers, and they are fairly high. So that's very, very broad. I wouldn't trust any individual of those lines, but it shows that there is quite some systems where nutrients from, river dis uh, from groundwater discharge can be important regionally. If I even zoom in one more step, so the only time I talk about local today, the, la um, the last example is SGD and fishes. We went to Mauritius and other places and checked submarine springs or sites of submarine springs in a coral reef versus control sites. So you see a coral reef, there would be submarine springs here, there are no submarine springs here, and we counted the fish. And what we saw is that at the springs, there were much more fish than in the control site and also than in the spring influence site. Now, this just compares to site. I can't actually, we, we, we cannot say why, and if this is just an accident. We did that at different places, and it, it's a red thread. It usually there's more fish at those springs. So we see that locally, they also seem to have a strong relevance. So that brings me to my summary. I would say that at the global scale, the total global vol volume of fresh SGD is fairly small compared to, river to rivers. And honestly, I'm a, when we found that, I was a little bit disappointed. I would have liked to produce larger numbers, but they're actually not too huge. But regionally, and that counts for individual islands, individual stretches of coast, as we have seen before, fresh SGD can be really relevant for nutrient budgets and also for, the, for ecological processes. And also, these regions have a tendency to be in tropical regions. So tropical regions are hotspots for fresh SGD and for its consequences. Also, islands are hotspots for that. And we talked about data before. Unfortunately, they are also places where we have very little data. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm really looking forward to discussion and questions. Thank you, Neil. Uh, any questions? We have a few minutes for questions. Um, hi, uh, this is Julia Moriarty from CU Boulder. Thanks for that talk. Um, I was curious for the modeling that you were doing. Um, so in the beginning of the session, there was um, like the schematics of the different aquifers coming in at sort of different vertical layers. And so when you're doing, I think your model looked like it was more um, like sort of one aquifer. And I was wondering yes. if you have like, you know, layers of mud or something causing different aquifers to occur. Is that something this modeling can account for? Is that um, somewhere where you wouldn't be able to apply the model to estimate um, SGD coming out into the coast. Um, what are some of the um, uncertainties around that? Yeah. So this thanks. model. And thanks for the talk. Model, right? Sorry. Yeah. This um, the the model that we did actually really represents one aquifer, a single aquifer of a hundred meter thickness. Um, and this is certainly one of the big uncertainties because we don't know the actual thickness of the aquifers at the coast. And we also, you have seen, and you, you mentioned the different layered aquifers and also the confined units. We, we didn't model that, so we wouldn't know how much comes out of that. And theoretically, we know a lot or quite some SGD can come from out of that. Maybe one interesting number, I've been asked often, like how far off the coast can it be? 
And the further most example I know of is about, I think, 200 kilometers offshore um, the eastern US. So in about 500, 500 meters depth, they suspected SGD. They really, they haven't exactly seen it, but they suspected a submarine spring there. And our model would certainly not represent that. Thank you, Neil. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Craig Connolly uh, from EPA. 27 minutes. All right, great. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Craig Connolly. I'm a research ecologist uh, with the EPA Office of Research and Development in Narragansett, Rhode Island. Um, it's my pleasure to be speaking with you all today on groundwater and dissolved organic carbon uh, in uh, super permafrost coastal systems of northern Alaska. Okay, so I wanted to start with this image, um, similar to some of the images we saw before about SGD, um, except there's uh, one difference that you may notice, and that's what the coastline looks like. Um, and I'll show some other images of this too, uh, but in northern Alaska, this is a continuous permafrost coastline, which means that groundwater is flowing largely through a very shallow aquifer on land of only, at most, 60 centimeters, 50 centimeters, and that's the deepest it gets during the summer. Um, and so kind of breaking down this title, um, um, we're talking about the groundwater that is flowing on top of the permafrost, that's super permafrost, uh, that is essentially seeping from the tundra into coastal systems of northern Alaska. Uh, so before talking too much, um, I want to show you my disclaimer here. Um, and now let's uh, transition into uh, the Arctic terrestrial freshwater system. So we, we've heard from Joe and Niels um, that, uh, that, uh, about SGD, about what SGD is, um, how we measure it, how we go to understand it. Mills talked about uh, the freshwater component and its importance uh, uh, from a global perspective. Well, now I'm taking you to a uh, much more regional, um, uh, regional investigation of what uh, groundwater is in, in northern Alaska. And uh, in particular, in the Arctic terrestrial freshwater system, uh, we have to be thinking about groundwater uh, much differently than other regions of the world. And that's because the Arctic has very distinct uh, seasonality in terms of its temperature and its precipitation. Uh, it is uh, in the high latitudes, um, groundwater is flowing um, over continuous permafrost landscapes. Um, that is limiting the flow to very surface and shallow um, uh, aquifers. So that it's primarily a surface water or runoff dominated system. Um, but also, uh, this is a region of the globe that is particularly vulnerable to climate change. And I have a few slides about that in a moment as well. So um, talk, I want to first talk a little bit about the seasonality of the Arctic terrestrial, terrestrial freshwater system. And I did have a slide on here for the winter, but it wasn't very exciting. Uh, because as you can imagine, high latitude systems, the Arctic uh, coastal zone is largely frozen, snow covered, and iced over. So uh, for the most part, we don't really think of groundwater flowing uh, that far north during the winter. And there's very little, if any, connectivity between uh, water coming from land and uh, into the uh, coastal ocean. But around May and June, this time of year, uh, the, warm, the temperatures are rising and they're getting warm, up, warm enough to cause a massive spring snowmelt period called the freshet. And that pushes a lot of that snowmelt, all of that snowmelt water uh, to rivers, which then exit out to the coast. During this time, the seasonally thawed active layer, that is the portion of the soil profile that thaws each and every summer uh, above permafrost, that is very shallow during this time, only centimeters deep. Uh, and so there is some groundwater that is flowing and that is making its way to the coast, but it's in those very shallow superficial horizons. And they happen to also be uh, very organic rich. As we move into the summer around July, September, uh, the, that spring snowmelt pulse has largely made its way out to the uh, to coastal waters. Uh, we see a deepening of that seasonal active layer, um, and that increases the relative portion of groundwater flow relative to surface water flow. So we see an increase in groundwater flow during uh, the summer time period. And I also include a bullet here 
for intermittent rain pulses uh, because that is an important uh, control over groundwater movement is, is when it rains. So, so why as Arctic system scientists are we interested um, uh, in, in groundwater or in the hydrologic system in general? Well, um, it's because of climate change. It's uh, one of the systems that's most vulnerable to climate change. Um, it is, the Arctic is uh, warming at a rate that is uh, two, or th two to three times faster than the global average. That is resulting in uh, increases in precipitation and a change in the seasonal variability of that pre precipitation also changes the um, magnitude, or uh, sorry, the distribution of snowfall versus rainfall in the Arctic. At the same time, uh, with those warming uh, temperatures, we see uh, a deepening of the active layer because of thawing permafrost. So now there is uh, a greater portion of a soil profile that can interact and mix um, with groundwater, and um, that has implications for the hydrologic properties of the system. Um, a colleague of mine, Mike Rollins, um, put out a paper um, in the cryosphere recently uh, that demonstrated that over the next 21st century, we're expecting to see a pretty large increase in the relative uh, proportion of subsurface runoff relative to total runoff because of the deepening af uh, active layer. And uh, this is most pronounced across the continuous permafrost regions of the Arctic and during the summer and thaw period or summer and fall periods. And then, of course, one of the hottest topics in the news today is thinking about permafrost thaw with respect to the global carbon cycle. The top few meters of uh, soils and permafrost contain a disproportionate amount of organic carbon when that permafrost thaws that is mobilizing that previously frozen and stored carbon into the contemporary carbon cycle. So uh, that is another uh, reason why when we think about groundwater and carbon, we're also thinking about thawing permafrost. So um, thinking about studying groundwater, people have been studying groundwater in, uh, in Alaska and other parts of the region for a long time. This is largely uh, within the context of um, contributions to streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, more inland water bodies. Um, and it really wasn't until the last 10 years or a little bit longer that we started ramping up our interest in our investigations of that same tundra, super permafrost groundwater, but in the context of coast, co coastal systems. Um, and to illustrate that point, I'm showing you this map here from Santos et al. that, that we saw previously of the sites where uh, fresh or saline groundwater discharge has been measured. The bottom figure from DIOC at, at all 2023 um, that is for uh, groundwater that has been met, groundwater discharge that has been measured either in coastal systems, high latitude or high altitude. And so what I want to show you here is we just we generally see a lack of study sites um, or studies uh, in uh, the high latitude systems with respect to groundwater. So um, it historically is an understudied and, and perhaps overlooked um, uh, part of Arctic system science. Um, however, that like I said, that is that is ramping up, and there are a number of studies. Uh, that have come out and are going to continue to come out um, uh, in northern Alaska. Okay, so all that to say, we're still building baseline understanding of uh, the export of freshwater and carbon, the composition of that carbon, and its role that it's playing uh, for coastal ecosystems in the Arctic. Um, and so here I want to show up a few pictures of what, what this groundwater actually looks like. And I guess I should start by saying, um, you know, one of the prevailing conceptual models which has been um, adapted is that the, uh, the, this, high north, this far north, uh, that permafrost presents this impermeable barrier uh, to groundwater flow, um, and that this permafrost, uh, this ice barrier, is, is largely distributed. In other words, there's not really a lot of um, thawed substrate for groundwater to move. And so that's what's being shown here on this top image. Um, however, this conceptual model has been revised recently, and, and I um, anticipate it's going to continue to be revised. And in fact, that groundwater does flow through this active layer here during the, during the spring and especially during the late summer time period. Uh, when you get down to the coast, that groundwater is flowing on top of the, uh, the ice-bounded permafrost. Um, but um, with some recent work uh, from electrical resistivity measurements, we've identified there is a uh, subterranean aquifer that exists beneath uh, shallow coastal estuaries. And that, so there is a conduit for this groundwater to now move to the beach and also to start mixing with some of these zones. 
In this talk, I'm going to be uh, focusing solely on this component here. That is the uh, groundwater that's flowing above permafrost um, adjacent and abutting the coast. Uh, so back to this, back to these images here. So what, what does this groundwater actually look like? Well, here's a, uh, an image of um, what is uh, the typically the primary surface of uh, the, the coastal zone in northern Alaska. You can see it is characterized by high-centered ice wedge polygons. Um, and during the summer, as the active layer thaws and as these ice wedge polygons degrade, uh, water starts to form in these ponds and these troughs. Um, and uh, that serves as a source of groundwater that uh, then drains to the coast. There's, of course, also groundwater that is flowing within the center polygons themselves, but a lot of water is collecting kind of on the edges of these polygons and making its way uh, to Arctic coastal uh, zone. We also see uh, that there is groundwater that is flowing underneath the beach. Uh, we can stick piezometers just like here, and we can pull up the groundwater along the beach um, down to about one meter, but I, I, as I said, where there's likely groundwater that's also flowing uh, uh, much deeper. This groundwater is also forming as uh, springs uh, that emerge from the, the coastline. Again, these are, this would be like an example of, let's say, uh, a drainage from a trough or an in-between a polygon. There's also a lot of coastal erosion um, uh, along the coast, and, uh, and as that, uh, that permafrost uh, erodes and melts, that forms these pools and that also drains. So when we think about that super permafrost terrestrial fresh groundwater, we're thinking a lot about groundwater that we can see in these pictures here, but also what's flowing underneath the beach. Okay, um, so here I want to show some estimates of, uh, of groundwater discharge from that terrestrial fresh component. Uh, this first estimate is actually from a study um, um, near Tulik, uh, sorry, not Tulik, it is near Tulik, in Naviat Creek uh, in Alaska. Um, and the rest are based on coastal studies from uh, within lagoon systems, uh, and one that is for uh, the entire Alaska Beaufort Sea coastline. Um, and what, what we see is the discharge is, is relatively low, 0.28 to 5.5 cubic meters per day per meter of fresh water that is essentially just seeping off the tundra during the summer. And one value I'd like to point out, and that's this one for the Beaufort Sea coast, uh, that is estimated by Demir et al., a paper that's in review, and I'm very excited it will be coming out soon, if you take this value for the entire Alaska Beaufort Sea Coast and you scale it for the whole coastline, uh, which is uh, uh, 1,957 kilometers long, we get a late summer groundwater flux value of 6 times 10 to the 6 cubic meters per day. So to the bring that into the context of, of rivers, uh, the river flux that uh, we can estimate from a paper by Mike Rollins at all 2021 uh, in the month of August is 8 times 10 to the 7 uh, cubic meters per day. Um, and so putting these together and also a trend that it seems uh, that we, we've heard about before is that the groundwater, uh, this terrestrial fresh groundwater coming, seeping off the, the, the tundra is only about 1% or less than 1% of the total uh, river flux uh, during the summertime period. In other words, what, what we've measured and um, estimated is that this fresh water component that is seeping off the tundra is relatively small relative um, to the uh, river component. So uh, that terrestrial freshwater component um, is only about 1%. However, um, you may be wondering, well, what about the, the carbon? We know that in uh, the continuous permafrost systems that, uh, that the, there's lots of organic rich soils, it's very peaty, and so um, we were very much interested in, well, how much carbon is in this groundwater that's flowing to the coast? And from about 100 samples that were collected along the Alaska Beaufort Sea coastline, mostly in uh, shallow lagoon systems where the topography is relatively flat, just like this one, we've estimated that groundwater DOC ranges in about 10 to almost 70 or just over 70 milligrams of carbon per liter. So, uh, that's a lot of dissolved organic carbon in groundwater, and that's about an average of 40 milligrams of carbon per, li per liter. And it's no wonder that we have so much carbon, because when we are sampling and walking along the coastline, we're all, we're, we, have to, we have a hard time not tripping over springs and streams that look like this, that have groundwater that's flowing, that uh, 
looks very much like the coffee uh, that you might be drinking. So it has lots of carbon. And in a study that, that I led with colleagues on where this carbon is coming from, uh, we identify that most of it is coming from that very rich uh, peaty organic uh, soil horizon that's at the surface. There is an appreciable amount that's coming from deeper in the active layer, and there is a, uh, uh, also appreciable about, amount, about 10%, that might be coming from thawed, thawing permafrost. Okay, so if we continue with our scaling exercise, um, we, can, we estimate that um, on a kgs per kilometer per day basis, that that terrestrial fresh groundwater that is entering the uh, northern Alaska coastline uh, could be around the ballpark of 135 kgs per kilometer. Um, now, when we compare that to other very well-known sources of uh, DOC and carbon export, streams and rivers, coastal erosion, we see that we're, we're, we're eventually com uh, essentially coming up with numbers that are within the ballpark of what all the, the rivers and streams might be exporting um, during the month of August, um, as well as uh, what uh, coastal erosion might be exporting uh, for, and this is only for one site, Drew Point, Alaska, but this is one of the highest, uh, the, sorry, the fastest eroding coastlines in the world. Um, and so this is really helping us um, understand that this, this groundwater component um, is, is large, but it's also comparable to other very well known um, uh, fluxes of DOC. So it's something that um, we should continue to study and uh, we should not ignore. Okay, so how, how does this terrestrial fresh supra permafrost groundwater discharge compare on the global scale? I'm showing you this map here uh, that we've seen a few times before. And uh, continuing with our, our extrapolation exercise, we, we can estimate that that freshwater discharge um, is 184 uh, meters square per summer. And that summer value is across 60 days, and it's a, it's a pretty good estimate of what might be um, the export for the total annual um, amount, uh, simply because groundwater is not flowing uh, very much um, or at all during the winter. And so if we compare our 184 to um, this uh, histogram here with all of the other um, sites and modeled areas, we can see that um, the, the, the measured and modeled estimates are, are pretty similar. And what it's, it's kind of telling us a story that we can see in this, this map here, if we just kind of uh, take our eyes across the uh, Arctic coastline, is that the freshwater component is uh, relatively small relative um, compared to other sites around the world in terms of that, that fresh SGD. Okay, so getting back uh, to the carbon, um, something that you might be interested in learning about is what is the bioavailability of this carbon? What is the fate of this dissolved organic carbon? Um, is, it, is it actually something that microorganisms are using or is it helping to uh, fuel biogeochemical cycles and ecosystem productivity? Um, and in this slide, um, I'd like to highlight results um, that were done by my colleague, Emily Bristol. Uh, she was at the University of Texas at Austin, is now a postdoc at the USGS. And she conducted um, bioavailability experiments uh, using groundwater, uh, that uh, surface runoff that I showed some pictures of, and then also of river water and what's presently in shallow estuary or lagoons. Emily also measured the DOC concentrations of those samples uh, uh, and uh, evaluated uh, the relationship between bioavailability and the high resolution composition of the DOM compounds uh, in that groundwater, and that's this figure here. Um, so I, I won't go through um, quite the seasonality component, but feel free to find me um, after the talk if you, like to if you would like to discuss that. Um, but generally, what we can see is that, uh, that this groundwater DOC, we find higher concentrations than rivers, than what's presently in the lagoon, and that what's uh, running off from the surface. Um, with respect to that biodegradable DOC, we do see higher uh, BDOC values in that groundwater compared to rivers and lagoons. And we, we uniquely also see high BODOC uh, in this runoff, which um, I anticipate is kind of very similar in composition to that groundwater. So those experiments suggest that uh, this groundwater is degradable, and it's degradable over a relatively short time frame. I have to check with Emily how long these incubations were run, but it's possible they are either 28 days or, or 60 days. So moving now to this complicated Van Krevelin diagram, um, what this is showing us is the um, correlation between 
um, uh, molecular compound classes and BDOC. Um, and without uh, spending too much time on it, I'd just like to share uh, that what it's illustrating is that this uh, groundwater geom is containing uh, bioavailable compounds that are phenolic and polyphenolic compounds. These are um, what we generally think of the kind of fresh vegetation leachate. This makes sense because that's uh, pretty much that's exactly what this groundwater is. But surprisingly, um, we, we do find that it's degradable. So it kind of contradicts um, previous understanding or studies out there that have suggested that phenolic and polyphenolic compounds are very resistant to degradation. Well, in this case, we're finding that they are degradable. Okay, um, and I'd like to end talking about uh, the submarine groundwater discharge that's uh, been investigated in this region. Um, I, uh, it's, uh, and, and this is um, kind of now separating from the terrestrial fresh comp freshwater component, but moving into um, the studies and the total SGD. And so here is uh, an example of a study that I was um, fortunate to be, to be a part of um, that used electrical resistivity to um, simply identify where do we find ice and where do we find the subterranean estuary. Um, and it was, the, the goal was to more or less contradict or challenge this conceptual diagram. Um, and the, the results did find that there is um, thawed sediment that is well beneath the lagoon surface, that is well beneath the beach, and that might even be extending further on land. Uh, so there is uh, plenty of uh, thawed substrate available for that groundwater to flow, for that um, SGD to be mixing uh, with this zone here. There have been a number of studies that have estimated total uh, SGD in um, uh, uh, coastal systems in northern Alaska, and those are listed here. Several of them are in shallow lagoon systems, but there has been a couple studies that have, have taken their measurements out further into uh, open water. And what I've done is I've summarized the range of those total SGD in this image here, where we see a, a pretty large range of values going from six to uh, 890 cubic meters per day per meter. And this is for the, the summer, July, and August timeframe. And so if we, plot, if we put our fresh SGD component on there, which ranges about 0.28 to 0.55, we can see that, again, that, that freshwater component is relatively small compared to the total SGD component. However, interesting, interestingly, we do see that the high end of the fresh does overlap or is close to the, the low end of the total SGD. Um, and there has been some studies that have come out recently that um, have, uh, have put mechanisms to why uh, we might see higher or lower uh, total SGD in the systems. And, and that could be related to uh, uh, winds, could be related, uh, related to hy and hydrologic uh, conductivity. Okay, so um, zooming back out to the global scale, uh, taking this total SGD value, that range, in fact, uh, we can extrapolate that for the entire Alaska Beaufort Sea coastline, and we get a number that is about 0.4 to 5.3 times 10 to the 4 uh, meters square for the entire summer. And if you compare that to estimates uh, from the Santos et al. Nature Review paper, um, we see that that Alaska um, S total SGD is is stacks up pretty well compared to, to other SGD estimates. So um, all that to say there, there is um, plenty of uh, opportunity for SGD to be circulating uh, with subterranean estuaries and to be um, an important flux of water, nutrients, and carbon. We'll just have to wait a little bit for that paper to come out. Okay, um, so I'd like to leave um, leave you with some future directions of where I see uh, this field, this research going in the next 5, 10, 15 years, however long it takes you to get up to northern Alaska. Um, the first is uh, to further constrain seasonal discharge and hydrologic drivers of groundwater components. So there's still a relatively small amount of studies that we, that we, that we have at our disposal, um, and I think we, uh, we, would like, we should continue um, quantifying that fresh component, that recirculated component, component and that total component. Um, we should improve understanding of the regional and pan-Arctic dissolved organic carbon and inorganic carbon budgets. Again, we're, we're, I feel like we're just scratching the surface with the importance of organic carbon and inorganic carbon in that terrestrial freshwater uh, SGD component in uh, northern Alaska and the Arctic as a whole. <clears throat> 
Uh, we should look to expand knowledge of groundwater's role in coastal ecosystem uh, function and structure. We saw some evidence that this groundwater DOC is biodegradable. Let's, let's keep going. Let's see how important it is uh, for the heterotrophic activity of these systems during the summer. And then lastly, uh, is to identify and forecast the climate change impacts. Part of the motivation for all of us Arctic system scientists is to think about those impacts of permafrost thaw and erosion, summer storms, and a longer open water period. So with that, I'd like to thank several of my collaborators on this work as a whole, um, and I'd be happy to take any of your questions. Uh, we have a question online from Bob Anderson. Craig, with the thawing permafrost where you work, do you see evidence for acidification related to iron cycling as is seen in the Brooks Range where thawing permafrost has been associated with acidification? That's a great question. I, in streams and rivers, I've definitely seen um, lots of iron. We see orange streams that pop up and they are just full of iron. Um, and likely acidic waters. Along the coastline, um, I'm not actually sure. I think there have been some studies that um, have demonstrated that because the system is very heterotrophic, there's lots of organic carbon, we do see more acidification. Um, however, that's a, a little bit out of my wheelha wheelhouse to answer. It's a good research question, so great proposal. <laughs> great, thanks. Uh, I think we might, do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Uh, Jeff Bohm from Scripps. Uh, that was a great talk. Thank you. And apologies if I missed this, but um, as the active layer deepens, so you mentioned that right now groundwater discharge is a small fraction of riverine discharge, but as that active layer deepens, will there be a significant increase in uh, groundwater discharge? Yeah, I, uh, that's what I would anticipate, yes. I think, and I think it's because there'll be more additions of meltwater um, as the active layer is thawing. We're also seeing in uh, more rain that's occurring throughout the summer. So that's going to add to groundwater flowing through that active layer as well. Um, so I would anticipate that over time that that component would increase proportionally to the total SGD. Okay, thank There's you. A, uh, I think we'll hold the questions. Uh, maybe one more. Alicia Wilson, University of South Carolina. Uh, my very quick question was, did you had your groundwater fluxes in meters per meters squared per summer? Am I interpreting it correctly that that's cubic meters per meter of coastline per summer? Yes, yes, that's correct. Okay, yeah, multiply by meters of coastline, the numbers get much bigger. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, thanks, Craig. Thanks, Craig. Uh, next, we have Dr. Megan Eagle uh, joining us from the USGS. Thanks. So I'm, as you'll see shortly, I'm going to take you into the world of carbon transformations within the subterranean estuary, and that's just to give you a little bit of a flavor of, um, you know, what we're, there we go, what we're seeing. Um, so as you'll see, all of us have our favorite SGD picture. Um, we're very proud when you can actually visualize what we study. Um, this is Wakoit Bay, which is just down the road, um, and you'll see water's flowing out. Um, out of the beach there, um, there's been a lot of study here about the impact of nitrogen on the, uh, on the coastal ecosystem, um, and it's kind of just some really like foundational work about what kind of um, cycling with iron oxides and other components that we're seeing that are important for um, thinking about cycling of carbon in these systems. Um, so what you don't see is what's underneath, which you'll probably have heard all of us saying now. Um, and this is just um, getting back to some of the stuff that Joe has talked about and the other uh, speakers have mentioned is what are the drivers, and the, I'm not going to go over all the physical drivers again, but I do want to mention how they relate to kind of what's driving the chemistry in this system, um, because it's really the hydrogeology um, that is deliver, responsible for delivering reactants um, such as oxygen, sulfate, and the organic matter into this zone. Um, and, you know, we don't have a lot of pictures of our, of our subterranean estuaries, which I was going to talk about, but this is one of them. This is a karst system with very um, large macro pore spaces. Um, and you'll see, we, we can't you normally visualize the, the salinity mixing zone or where this really um, dense uh, or, or sharp zones and redox are. But what we're actually sampling here is that, you know, several 
it's about 100 meters below the surface in the Yucatan. Um, we're sampling that transition zone here, and this is a, a type of sampling that we very rarely get to do as um, people who study submarine groundwater discharge. But um, throughout uh, this talk, I'm going to show you some case studies. Only one of them is my own um, case study. But I want to show the, you these to kind of have a takeaway that this is an advective environment. And because it's advective, um, that really kind of has to change what tools we use to look at the different elemental cycling, especially carbon cycling. Um, and it also means that a lot of reactions are going on at the same time. So in a diffusive environment, sometimes you can separate those reactions a little bit. Um, and in these environments, everything's mixing. Um, and so we can have cryptic cycles, we can have microenvironments that are really important for what's going on. Um, you know, we, we've already mentioned that kind of new versus recycled carbon. The form of carbon really matters, right? Whether it's organic or inorganic, um, it could be methane. And because there are so many different um, potential reaction pathways, we can really vary that, um, the ratio of delivery from the subterranean estuary to the ocean of what that form of carbon is. Um, and it matters what the flow rate are, what the flow rate is, what the residence time is, what the lithology is, um, if it has an organic carbon source, where that organic carbon source is coming from. Um, and microbes are not necessarily obligate in a lot of these systems, and so you can have multiple reactions um, going on at the same um, concurrently. And so um, I'm just going to go very um, briefly over what those kind of three main kind of water masses I need you to keep in mind as we talk about carbon transformations in the subterranean estuary. The first is that terrestrial component. You guys heard a lot about that. It brings in a lot of DOC. It's oxic. And it typically, um, that level of DOC and how oxic it is is due to the flow path. It can be long or short depending on what the kind of the topography is um, of delivery. And so, um, and it's typically all fresh. Um, and so when we think about then that recirculated component, there's two I want to call your attention to. One is that deeper uh, recirculation. It can be due to that kind of uh, density-driven recirculation that Joe mentioned at the beginning. Um, and these typically set up with a uh, circulation cell. And so they're associated with these really sharp redox gradients um, as well as salinity gradients. So it's where you see pH. CO, um, uh, ORP really vary um, depending on what's happening. These deeper flow paths um, where you bring in seawater, they have um, high concentrations of sulfate. The seawater comes in oxic um, as that uh, transitions through the, uh, through the subterranean estuary. Depending on what the carbon source is, you can start to actually take out that oxygen, take out that sulfate. Um, and how long that water has to engage and interact in this system can depend on whether it goes anoxic or not. Some subterranean estuaries are anoxic, some are not. There's a really huge variability in this. Um, but I just want to note that these typically have a longer residence time. This deep circulation cell, um, it can vary on the order of um, seasons to years. Um, we, we talked about how tidal uh, influences really are, which you'll see in the next slide. But I want to notice that um, because the freshwater discharge sets up some of this recirculation cell, you have to think about that hydraulic gradient. And the hydraulic gradient for um, the subterranean estuary depends on both um, the fresh side as well as the, um, the seawater side. And so in a, kind of the way we used to model this in the past, we, we would fix the sea level at a, a static um, level, but we've noticed that that's not really um, very helpful for realistically modeling this. So I want you to think about, okay, what are the seasonal controls on terrestrial groundwater? Um, what are the seasonal controls on the you know, sea level? Because um, those are all important for the flow that goes through the subterranean estuary. Um, and then um, the last kind of recirculating um, seawater is that kind of short-lived. It's tidal pumping or wave pumping. We kind of divide those by where they happen um, within uh, uh, the, if they're near shore or a little bit offshore. Tidal pumping can happen way offshore. Um, but these have a much shorter residence time. Um, and they can actually be a much higher flow rate as well. Um, it depends on the interactive interaction between permeability, um, the tide range, and, and a, a variety of other things. But these are bringing in full seawater sulfate. Um, of the DOC concentration of seawater um, and the oxygen concentration of seawater. I want to note against all of this when we're thinking about carbon, when we think about ocean or estuary DOC, it can be low um, depending on how eutrophic it is. 
But when we're thinking about the inorganic carbon pool, DIC is pretty high in the ocean. And so anything um, we're thinking about in terms of creating new DIC or DIC production, it's against a background of a pretty high uh, concentration initially. And so our methods have to be sufficient to identify that, that new DIC pool. So I just want you to think about that as I take you through um, the case studies. But first, we're going to take a stop at this. Um, I already uh, told you that there are a lot of different reactions that could be going on. And there's a lot going on here. We pretty much have every reaction that's possible up here, I think. Um, and it's not for you to read all of those or think about all of those. It's really for you to think about sometimes we think about what reaction can occur in terms of um, how much energy it might produce and think, oh, okay, so if this produces more energy, then we can't have something producing less energy. That really, um, that view is if there's something that might be obligate or not obligate. Um, it takes out that, you know, maybe there's some material that is accessible by a, a methanogen that isn't accessible by a sulfate reducer. That happens. And so, and in terms of this, like, nice, like, cascade of what might be happening, probably all of this is happening at the same time all mixed together. So we don't necessarily have um, a perfect setting to, to divide everything that's going on. And so a lot of the, the cycling of elements in carbon in particular, some of our tools don't help us um, answer the questions as finely as we need to. Um, and so I'll show you that. Um, but I just want that to be the backdrop for the rest of the stuff I, I show. So um, you have heard a lot about um, kind of the, the different sources of SGD. And so some of the ways that we track carbon is um, there's a lot of classically trained marine chemists in the SGD world. And so we love ourselves conservative mixing plots between terrestrial and marine sources. And so you'll see a lot of those in the slides. Um, I'll have to say that means that we can really well define what our terrestrial and marine sources are. So that's a struggle that we have a lot in um, uh, groundwater discharge is knowing what our end members are and knowing how, um, if we can trace those end members to the flux that we think that is representative. Uh, carbon isotopes are used quite a bit to kind of parse out terrestrial um, versus marine carbon across GOC, DIC, and POC. There are some studies that are using kind of compound specific, but those are less frequent in the SGD world. You've heard a lot about radium, and it's our kind of tracer as cho of choice because we have difficulty in direct measurements. Radium cycles um, through, you know, you heard about the production because it's a radioactive element. It also cycles based on ionic strength. Um, it cycles with uh, redox conditions. So if you think about the same things that are driving or varying with carbon cycling, it is really that redox environment, the pH, all of those things. Radium can cycle with those same things, and so there is you know, it's not a perfect tracer. It is biologically inert, but it is not chemically inert. So just keep that in mind. When you see some of these studies, and some of the reasons I'm showing you these studies is because I think it's really important to know when you see these big syntheses what some of the foundational numbers are that are being synthesized. Um, and also to think about, you know, oh, we need new tools and we need new approaches to some of the carbon cycling in this environment. So I want to show you where we are so that I can hopefully think about how we could use your tools and translate them into this environment. Um, and then I'll also say that we commonly use production and consumption ratios of a variety of um, elements such as alkalinity and sulfate to get at what that reaction pathway is, and that is a very imprecise tool. Um, and so that's something to think about as well. So I'm going to show you four case studies. Um, they have different top uh, topographies. Some are higher relief, some are lower relief. They have different geologies, karst versus silicate. They have different organic matter sources. Two of these are, um, one has mangrove, one has a salt marsh. And I'll talk about the intersection with blue carbon as when I talk about those. Um, and only one of them, the stage lot pond one, is a study that I specifically worked on. But I wanted to show you a little bit of, go internationally, um, and show you uh, some different, different approaches. So the first one is Obama Bay, Japan. It's a sandy siliclastic beach, um, and it has a 20 centimeter tidal range. So that's really, really small. It's forested, um, and there is some agricultural rice, agricultural rice paddies nearby. The springs um, are the source of terrestrial groundwater. So you've seen springs, you've heard about springs, and their marine groundwater was sampled through pits dug in the beach. So 
that's how they access their subterranean estuary. And you'll see a picture here of what it looks like. Um, what, what did they measure? They measured a lot of different things. And these are kind of an example of how we get to um, determining whether the source of carbon is, is, was produced within the subterranean estuary or not. So you'll see first over here, this is a salinity property plot. And it has both radium on the top. Um, and then it goes through our DOC, our DIC, and total alkalinity. Um, in this plot, we have our end members. So we have blue and green. Um, blue is the fresh groundwater. Green is the river. And then we have um, gray is our surface water. I cannot see at all the pointer, so I will stop using it. Um, and, and so really, I, I mentioned it's this like conservative mixing approach. And so you, when you draw a line between your two end members, if it's above it, you have addition. If it's below it, you have consumption. Um, and so they, you know, this is very commonly used to say, okay, well, are we producing this element in, in this environment? Um, and you'll see the radium is very clearly produced. As you heard, we, we, um, the subterranean estuary is a really, um, there's a lot of production there. Um, I would say, you know, it's a little less clear when you look at some of the DOC um, and DIC uh, stuff where exactly that production and consumption is happening. So you'll see that's some of our complications as we start having to dig deeper into the data. Um, another very common thing that you'll see is this um, relationship of DOC or DIC production. So this is the DIC that is new. Um, so we've taken out the recirculated DIC in this, in this um, view. Um, versus radium. And so if there's a positive relationship, we say, okay, they're coming from the same place. In this case, that would be the subterranean estuary, and it would be SUD associated. This particular site is dominated by fresh water, which, as you have now found out, is um, uncommon in the global perspective, but is important on a local scale. And in fact, over half of the DOC and DIC, um, the DOC is coming from fresh groundwater, which is the dark blue colors. Um, and about half of the DIC is coming from the fresh groundwater, um, and then rivers are a smaller component, but still important. Um, so I just wanted to show you that you know this is this is one type of um, in high relief, oh, high flow of, of fresh water. Um, it is still an important source of both DIC and DOC. Um, in terms of the next case study, I want to talk to you. This is Togo Bay in Hong Kong. It's a sandy siliclastic and carbonate beach that sits atop igneous rocks. It's a lot of one needle tidal range. It's very, very developed. Eutrophication is a problem here, and there's a mangrove. Um, so I, I, you know, I know there was a blue carbon session. I don't know if it was last year or the year before, some point during the pandemic. I believe it was virtual. Um, and so you might think, okay, what is the intersection of blue carbon and SGD? And I'll, I'll say the way that I typically answer that is, um, so blue carbon is the fixation of uh, carbon or uptake of atmospheric CO2 in coastal wetlands, including salt marshes and mangroves. Um, and that fixes that for some period of time away from uh, quick exchange. Um, this is the lateral flux of carbon out of ecosystems. And you know, looking at where the intersection of SGD and blue carbon is, is the fate, um, the predominant fate of fixed carbon in those coastal wetlands is actually leaving as dissolved carbon, whether it's organic or inorganic. And so that's where that intersection is with SGD and um, uh, blue carbon. SG and so how you think about what happens to that fixed carbon on long time scales is a question that we can all debate. Um, but that's where that intersection is. So hopefully that clarifies if you're thinking, wait, we've already talked about this. Um, so here they studied um, or they sampled extensively through that cross section of the subterranean estuary, getting fresh water on their upland well, and then um, saline groundwater throughout this thing or throughout the rest of the, the platform. And you'll see there's a nice mangrove on top. And I want to show two things. And this is the temporal time scale of the water chemistry. This is tidal. Um, so on our left, we have low tide um, and then a flood. So as the tide goes up, the, that panel right there is the high tide, and then the tide goes out. Um, so you'll see there's a very small amount of variability and salinity, which is the second um, series up. And that, um, is, is because there's some tidal pumping that you can see at the very uh, uh, landward side. Land is that, is that way, sea is this way. Um, but the salinity zone that is kind of fixed isn't changing very much. Alkalinity is not changing very much. What's changing a lot on a tidal time scale is the pH. 
Um, and obviously, pH then um, propagates through the carbonate system and it changes what our PCO2 is as well as what our DIC is, uh, concentrations are. Um, I know it's hard to see the orders of magnitude, but um, it, for DIC, for example, it goes from you know blue, dark blue is zero and the intense red is 5,000 micromoles per kilogram. And so it's a lot of variability over a tidal time scale. So when we're talking about end members and what do we multiply our water flow times, it's a challenge. Um, I'm going to show you seasonal time scale next. Um, this is uh, five different months at the same site. We're now looking at a broader swath of the subterranean estuary. And there's a lot of variability in the DIC concentrations over months as well. Um, and so integrating all of this into what are, what are our seasonal, interannual, et cetera, ver um, uh, drivers or fluxes, there's, here they saw a oh, greater discharge in the winter or in the wet season that was driven mostly by a change in water flux, not by a change in concentration. Um, and the SGD was always um, kind of the predominant uh, uh, source of DIC and alkalinity. Um, and here they did recharge uh, separately. But you can kind of start to see this is how we're getting those numbers that we're talking to you about. Um, the last thing I want to show you from Tolo Harbor is that that relationship of alkalinity to DIC, sometimes you'll see it as carbon, uh, uh, calcium production or sulfate um, consumption. And we use that to like, get at what um, pathway is being used. The issue is that multiple different reactions can result in the ratios that you measure. And so this is a really insensitive tool. Um, and uh, in this case, for example, you might look at this and say it was all sulfate reduction, but they actually had a lot of carbonate dissolution going on. And so they think it's a combination between aerobic respiration, sulfate reduction, and carbonate dissolution. And so you can't get that fully from this plot. And so we need tools that will help us get, get there. Um, this is a KARSP system. It's um, Oxbell Hawk Cave system. It's on the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, the mic it's microtidal. Um, it's car a KARSP system here are cenotes, which are these large submerged, submerged caverns that you can actually dive in. Um, I've, this is a colleague of mine, John Pullman, um, diving in this system. And it's a meteoric freshwater lens sitting atop um, a very, very long time scale recirculating marine groundwater. Um, this one recirculates on the order of thousands of years. Um, they've, they've aged this groundwater. Um, the source of the terrestrial water, they actually got a sample it directly. It's in the cenote, but um, the marine groundwater comes out as springs as well as um, they were able to sample it directly in, in this system. Um, here, they measured methane, DOC, and DIC concentrations, as well as isotopes. So I mentioned that carbon isotopes are one of the things we start to use and figure out, okay, where is this carbon coming from? Um, in this case, every scale bar you see here for, um, or sorry, the methane and the DOC are on log scales, DIC is not. Um, and again, in this system, because it's karst, the water has very high, per or very high permeability, the water can flow very fast through this. Fresh discharge dominates. And the last one, marine discharge dominated. Um, so they're having a huge um, cycling of DOC, which is terrestrially derived. So you can see it has that nice terrestrial uh, DOC signature. Um, and then it actually, there's this big input at depth of very light uh, DOC. And the story here is they're actually having methane um, transfer um, being produced um, and then transferring into the DOC pool. And so that methane is being produced in the saturated zone, which they can't sample, and coming down um, and being oxidized kind of at the, where the salinity transition zone um, is and right above it. And then that is all then flowing to the coast. But how do we pick our end member out of here of what, what the carbon concentration should be that's flowing to the coast? It's a real struggle. Um, in this system, they also have carbonate uh, dissolution. So, so there's a lot going on here. It's a very complicated to get these carbon fluxes. I did want to say that in this study, they did our uh, 16 RNA. And um, I'll say I'm not a microbial person at all. I've learned I need to learn a lot more about that. But I want to say that less than 10% of, of the organisms that they were able to find were able to actually be identified and actually um, attributed to an actual function. And so I would say we do not know who's doing what in subterranean estuaries at all, um, very, very little. And I think this is an area that we need to do a lot more in. 
My last case study um, is Sage Lot Pond. It's a coastal uh, salt marsh um, that has about one to two meters of peat sitting atop a sand siliclastic uh, glacial deposits. It's right down the road in Laquate Bay, which is one of our National Estuarine Research Reserves. Um, very developed, and we were able to sample terrestrial groundwater with an upland well and then marine groundwater um, across this um, zone where we have, I differentiate peat um, and then the coastal sand aquifer. And this is work that I did with Joe Tamborski, who was our first uh, speaker. And so, you know, what is the magnitude of SGD here? Um, poor water, groundwater that is salty is the dominant flux. Um, there is some terrestrial groundwater that goes through this system. And in this case, we didn't just divide it between salty groundwater and terrestrial groundwater. We divided it in what zone of the, um, like what depth that marine groundwater was coming from because we wanted to better pair our water flux with our chemistry uh, because we have large gradients in chemistry with depth. Um, and I'll say we don't have um, multi-year, multi-season measurements of SGD at a lot of places. We have them here. Um, there's three years, 2015, 2016, and 2019 shown. And there's a lot of variability in what the total water exchange is. Um, and we think that um, uh, in the summer, uh, we actually have a little bit of a higher um, uh, sea level here than we do in the winter. It's the thermosteric effects. It's about normally five-ish centimeters. Um, on certain years, there are things that drive our sea level even higher. For example, El Nino this year, we had a 15 centimeter um, rise. Um, it was crazy. Um, and when we had our highest uh, sea level, uh, we had our highest actually flow rates um, in 2019. And then if you think about propagating that down through what our carbon rates are, you'll see our carbon rates were much, much higher in 2019. Our carbon export was much higher than that. Um, and when we think about what's driving this radium flux, you'll see here it's tidal inundation. So basically we're just getting more water onto the marsh, the marsh holds onto it and then exchanges it back. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of variability that we probably aren't capturing depending on how long our, our studies are. And then I want to show you the carbon data um, from this particular study. I've got um, a lot of things up here. I've got methane, DIC, DOC, um, I have the carbon isotopes of DAC and DOC, and then I have sulfate. Because um, the kind of classic view here is that it goes through sulfate reduction. Um, we clearly have methane production going on in this system. Those are going on concurrently. Um, it's, there's no specific zone with the depth. Um, again, it's a rather blunt sampling tool that we have. Um, I didn't show you profiles because they're all over the place. It's an advective environment. It's being mixed um, pretty rapidly. We have huge amounts of DIC production. DOC is on a log scale. With DOC, I want to particularly call out DOC. Um, there's, this is our, our, our end member here. And you'll see end members here and here. And I draw nice little mixing lines. With DOC, my end member um, concentrations that I measured are over an order of magnitude variable. So how do I get an end member from that? If you want to know why I think this is a better end member, feel free to talk to me. But I'm just saying this is. This is some of the complications we have to get at when we start trying to pick into like, how do we get to our carbon flux? Um, and just want to show one last thing. I'm going to ding in just a second um, about what the isotopes are showing us because, you know, I, I mentioned we can use them to attribute source. We can only use um, isotopes to attribute source if we understand the fractionation we're seeing. Um, and I'm going to show you these isotope plots here. Clearly, there is mixing going on with the DIC isotopes, the DOC isotopes. Um, mixing does not appear to be as important. Um, so if we look at these in a production, so these are um, uh, keelene plots where I plot the isotopic composition on the y-axis, one over the um, uh, concentration on the x-axis. And then the intercept is supposed to give you the input um, uh, isotopic composition of what's being produced here. A couple things jump out. For DIC, it is very clear that the same input source is um, coming um, for all kind of like sections of the subterranean estuary. The sandy part is getting terrestrial carbon coming in, and um, the, um, the marshy part is getting marine carbon. But what the heck is that minus 11? Because um, our soil organic pool, including our plants, um, is at minus 14. 
So we have to get our DIC pool and a lot of it really heavy. Can I turn it off? And we have to get, conversely, our DOC pool a lot lighter. So these green dots, um, which hit at about uh, minus 32, um, are all a salinity of over 27. So this is not terrestrial groundwater carbon coming in at a minus 27 um, signature. So you know, here now we have the carbon source, which is very clearly marsh derived, but it doesn't look like the marsh. Um, and so there are some things I threw up here that it could be um, happy to talk about it, especially if you have any ideas beyond what I wrote up there. Would love to talk to you. Um, I just want to say, and I'm sorry, I'm going to my question time, but um, we need new approaches to evaluating these reactions. Um, what we're using right now is currently limiting, and I don't think we have our one carbon isotope fractionation with some of the reactions that we're seeing, which I'm sure everybody who does that, whether there's the deep sea or not, or surface water can say the same thing. You saw some syntheses um, about uh, groundwater. Um, fluxes, magnitudes, and other nutrients. I think we need to go there for carbon. Um, and I want to say that this SGD, or this carbon associated with SGD, is, is ultimately fixed, um, both on, or on land, on the ocean, or on the wetland. Um, but the form of carbon that it goes into the ocean really matters. And we don't know how that's going to change with a high sea level, high temperature, high CO2 world. We need to start, if we're, if we're serious about integrating um, terrestrial and uh, ocean across that continuum, we have to probably include SGD in that. Um, so not probably, we definitely have to. And microbes, I'm not a microbial ecologist, but as far as I can tell, we don't know enough and we need to know more. Anyway, thank you. Uh, we have our uh, next and final speaker, Dr. Alicia Wilson. Uh, she is gonna keep zooming us out even more. Uh, and talking about the marine SGD component. And then we'll reconvene uh, uh, in the front with our panel and also uh, our, both of our virtual speakers will be joining online for that. Okay, so Dr. Wilson. All right, in theory, I have a laser pointer. I do, yay, okay. Um, thank you, I will try to help you uh, stay awake after the uh, third day after lunch. I was like, well, at least I'll be able to stay awake because okay. I'm up here waving my arms around, okay. <laughs> Um, but as, as Shirley said, uh, we're zooming way out. Um, a lot of submarine groundwater discharge studies really have been those very local things, and uh, the radium signal lets us zoom way farther out. Um, so, and if you're hovering around in the back and it's not because you wanted to stand up, I don't mind if you come in and wait over some people. All right. So, let me get in here. Oh, I want to issue my thanks ahead of time because otherwise I get all excited and forget. Um, I've collaborated a lot with Billy Moore on this stuff. Scott White has done the seafloor geophysics. Uh, Angie Knapp is, and Mandy Joy have done a lot of the nutrients. Jay Pinckney is, you probably, you may know him, a uh, phytoplankton person, benthic microalgae on the seafloor. Does submarine groundwater discharge feed them? Um, Susan Langmore, geochemistry. These are two PhD students, Jacob and Cameron, a master's student, and scuba divers, because that's what we do. Okay, so um, you've already, I, Joe did such a good job introducing all this stuff. Um, so you have already seen this figure, except not in color. Um, and what it shows is just how much radium there is in the ocean. You heard that it's how much it is, and that's what's up here on the top. The volume of this globally exceeds river discharge. Right? So think of another arrow in the hydrologic cycle diagram that isn't there right now. Um, and I, one thing I really want to do is ask, how many people knew about this before this morning? Okay, word is getting out. Okay, that's, that's useful, because I was giving this talk a lot in geoscience departments last year, and you know, one person, no, nobody had heard of it. I was lucky if they'd heard of Ackman Transport, okay? So I'm really happy to be here. So. Um, this was, it really got the first evidence for this in the 90s, and it caused everybody and their other brother to rush out here to their local salt marsh or beach, right? And we just saw this ballooning of studies, and everybody was looking for this, but nobody found that discharge, right? So this led to some problems. All available evidence suggested that this volume of discharge 
should the nutrient inputs should exceed river discharge significantly, but nobody could figure out where the water was coming out. So how do you add this to your budget? How do you go and directly take samples? What do you do? So where is it? And that's what I want to talk about. I actually want to talk about two things. The first thing is, where is this water coming out? So um, there were some other things that made it really hard to figure out where this water might be coming out. Um, th there was just weird evidence. Okay, this is a paper from um, 1998, and what you're seeing is the shoreline is over on that side. Here's the continental shelf. This is the seafloor running up this way. All right, this was, they were out sampling for water column radium. Uh, they were racing to try and beat a storm, and they found this huge enrichment down here on the seafloor, 40 to 80 kilometers offshore. And I like to sometimes in North America, or at least in America, U.S., say what that is. That's 25 to 50 miles offshore. This really radium-enriched water, the only thing that could be is groundwater that has discharged to the ocean. And I need to, I forgot to issue my disclaimer on the first slide. When I say saline groundwater, I mean seawater salinity. It really, you talk about the definition of the subterranean estuary or where there's some component of fresh water. There's not really a component of fresh water here. This is seawater, except it's not anymore because it's been below the seafloor. Now it's groundwater. All right, so it's discharged in this area. All right, and Billy's been on a lot of cruises since then, and he could never find this again. Right? So it's not a long-term thing. It's a short-term thing. If it even lasts a month, he would have seen it. So this has got to be something that's like a period of days. Right? And I'm just going to remind you this whole, well, what could have caused this? One of our clues, wind? Don't know. Okay. Next one. This is data from a 2012 event um, that Rick Peterson published. And this is data from a pier at Myrtle Beach. Right? And what you see, uh, good thing we're oceanographers here. So there's DO is in green. All right, and you can see it fluctuating with the tide. Gray is the level of the tide. All right, you can see uh, water temperature is in blue. And so you're coming along here, fluctuating with the tide. All of a sudden, there's this huge drop in DO and temperature. All right, I think this audience knows what we're talking about when we see that this happened just after some upwell upwelling favorable winds started. All right, so this is another wind picture. But, and, well, Oh, sorry, and um, when they sampled this water, it was highly enriched in radium. So again, this had to be groundwater, right? And this was part of an ongoing thing. Uh, off Myrtle Beach, there would be fish kills periodically, and everybody thought, oh, it's stormwater retention pond, um, but they ruled that out, and then Billy and Rick figured this out. All right, so it's groundwater that's discharging somewhere, right, and can cause uh, anoxia. So the question is, where is this coming out? And what about these pulses? All right, how, what's the driving force for this? So let's think about that. You've seen this diagram on the left here before a couple of times. All right, and uh, the question is, what's the driving force? So if we go out here to uh, periods of sort of days and length scales of tens of kilometers, it's not on our list of driving forces that can cause SGD, right? It was just kind of hanging out there. Why is this happening? We don't have a conceptual model that explains it. You saw this picture also, all right? Same kind of thing. This one reaches much further offshore, say 40 to 80 kilometers offshore, but this kind of hydrogeologic conceptual model is very steady state, right? It doesn't explain the episodes. So it's fun to stretch out the mystery but it's only a 20-minute talk, so let's um, see what we can do. What, what we needed was some ground truth from somewhere, just something to corroborate the radium and actually see where the water's coming out. So we needed a time series, and we had a discussion about that a little earlier. How do you get a time series for submarine groundwater discharge? Hard to stake out the whole seafloor with radon, right? But we could stake out the seafloor with heat as a tracer. So what you're looking at is, and, and also then you can sample the groundwater. So what you're looking at on the left side is where we first established wells, right? And that's an area of about 100 square kilometers. The argument here is if you talk to Billy over the last 20 years, he said, you know, it's really hard to explain how much this water, how much water could be coming out right at the, at the shoreline. 
If you spread it out across the continental shelf and have it come out in a couple of pulses each year, you don't need that much flow in any given location. So that was sort of the sampling strategy here. We're like, well, if this much water is coming out, it has to be spread out. So we'll just instrument part of the seafloor and cross our fingers. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> OK, so um, we go from five kilometers offshore to uh, 20 kilometers offshore. And I'm going to tell you there's a Goldilocks zone right in here. These guys are 10 kilometers offshore. These are 15 kilometers offshore. And further inshore, I'm just going to say three words, active shrimping zone. I think that's as much as I need to say about why we don't have a lot of data from that. Um, further offshore, the unconsolidated sediment thinned, and it was hard for us to jet our equipment in. So what you're seeing on the other side of the slide here is data from well 12, 15 kilometers offshore. And let's just start with this top panel up here, and we'll, we'll work our way out. What you're seeing is our temperature data from below the seafloor. It was summer, so it was warmer at shallow depths and cooler at deeper depths. And yes, you're seeing a cooling event there. Oceanographers, upwelling event. Thank you. That was all I had to say. OK. Um, here is our, we, I have a whole model. We could talk about it. But um, here are the groundwater flow velocities that we extracted from that data, an inverse model. And what you see is little pulse of groundwater discharge associated with this cooling event, big pulse of groundwater discharge associated with this big cooling event. Right? So discharge coincided with upwelling favorable winds. It's what we discovered later. But imagine we're, we're right at this stage. We're like, why is this happening? And then it didn't happen the next year. So we're like, OK, here's a cooling event. Now no groundwater. What's going on? All right. So let's get to the upwelling favorable winds. We finally said, you know, there's no way that upwelling causes groundwater to discharge. We thought about it. Could cool water flowing over the warmer seafloor cause discharge? A short answer, 20-minute talk, no. OK, so what was happening? So we went back to what causes upwelling, upwelling favorable winds. And in this diagram, this, uh, this direction is upwelling favorable, and the brighter colors are faster. So what you see here is a sustained period of upwelling favorable winds. OK, well, wind doesn't drive groundwater flow either. So I finally asked my student, I said, does this wind cause sea level to change? And the answer was yes. Okay, so that can drive groundwater flow if sea level falls. I didn't include this going further back in time, but all the way from April of 2016 through the 1st of July in 2016, sea level never fell below this dotted line. Right? All of a sudden, beginning of July, sea level falls 20 centimeters below that line. Right? That's a hydrologic drive force that we can work with that can drive discharge of groundwater. Why did we not get groundwater exchange in 2017? Because the upwelling favorable winds weren't nearly as steady or strong. And you don't see anything remarkable here with sea level. Right? I want to give you another couple of examples. Right? Here's the pulse that Billy observed in 1998. Check out the drop in sea level right before they were out sampling. Right? Uh, here are Rick Peterson's events. Drop in sea level, low oxygen, right? That water had to discharge offshore and then be transported in the upwelling flow system, right, up to, all the way up to the pier. There's a little lag, right? Um, here, I want to plant in your head the idea of groundwater exchange rather than just groundwater discharge, okay? Here is Hurricane Dennis in 1999. If a drop in sea level causes groundwater to discharge. A rise in sea level causes seawater to flow down below the seafloor and become groundwater. Okay. Here's Hurricane Floyd. You can see storm surge, and then the storm went right over Billy's well field. This, is, this uh, next panel is also uh, is from Billy's well field from the 90s. Right. So then we have this. So the, the storm traveled right over the well field, and this is the record from one of the wells here. So what you see is it was summer, so the temperature is about 23 degrees, three meters down in this well, right? The storm came by, uh, so sea level rose, pushed warm water down to depths of about three meters in this well. 
This is just a dem uh, an indication of the driving force pushing seawater down into the subsurface. We can't use this to quantitatively decide how much water moved because when the storm went over, it pulled the cap off the well, and when they got there, there was an octopus living in it. <laughs> so, but it is an indication of exchange, and that starts to explain why this brown water is saline and not the fresh ground of water that we're talking about. It used to be seawater, and now it's not. Okay, so um, I, the, what I showed you was our first try at all this. I want to show you three years after that. Um, and I'm just going to say that our heat tracer method allows us to distinguish benthic exchange, that shallow 10 to 20 centimeters. Oh, we were calling it PEC, pore water exchange, right, Via, from uh, Chanaguchi. All right? We can distinguish that using heat versus our longer-term groundwater discharge. And when we do that, we get more accurate pictures. And so these look a little sharper. This is from the next three years, 2018 through 2020. Um, we don't have all summer every year. You remember what happened in 2020. Um, so this is just August through October. This, uh, actually 2019 was really good. We got May through the middle of September, uh, and this last year was July through the middle of September. Um, so what you see are these huge pulses of groundwater discharge happening multiple times a year. Um, Jacob is working on his paper. And it's all about the Azores high expands in July, and you get more upwelling favorable winds in this region. Perhaps you know of other reasons, uh, other places where upwelling events happen in the world. I'm just saying. So um, I also, oh, so he did the math. He added up all the pulses one summer, and they came out to about 70% of that big radium signal. We have a lot of salt marshes in South Carolina, too, so you can figure out where we can get the other 30%. We have way more shoreline than the crow flies if it's all this salt marsh, right? So we can explain the radium signal. So we could start including it in budgets now because we have some idea of where it's happening and why. All right, and this, uh, Billy finally got to publish a paper uh, in 2022. He finally knew when to go out and sample to find one of these episodes. And that's what this paper is. It's like we knew when to go. And then later, once Jacob downloaded the data, we were able to see these pulses of groundwater discharge. Right when Billy uh, sampled the highest gradient activities that he's sampled in this area ever. Um, so we're, we're getting better at this. All right, why is it happening so far offshore? You've seen all these coast these models where the, the tide goes up and down, the flow is focused right at the water line. You've seen this diagram, the freshwater saltwater interface. This is all very coastal, shoreline coastal, right? If you get far offshore, you know, if water goes up and down above a sand layer in a bucket, water doesn't go in and out of the sand, right? You have to have a hydraulic connection to something else for that change in water level to cause water to move in and out of the sand. So we need a hydraulic connection, and this is the hydraulic connection. Um, so idea here, this is my, uh, this one is not published yet. It's not even finished yet. This is my new conceptual model for flow in coastal areas in uh, passive continental margin. All right, so here's a salt marsh. The continent is behind here. Here's a little barrier island. This is that tiny little part of the Bratton figure that you can barely see when you zoom out to the scale of a continental shelf. And here are the first three confined aquifers coming out here, all right? And this is the idea. It's, it's a very low hydraulic gradient area. We don't have mountains in South Carolina unless you drive a lot farther away. So there is some fresh water. It's still in these aquifers, but it's moving toward the ocean pretty slowly. What's happening much faster is all this exchange out here at the seafloor. Okay. Now, there's exchange on every tidal signal, but that doesn't move the radium around, right? That moves really young water in the top little bit of the seafloor, just because tides don't last very long. So you can't move a lot of water on any individual tide, and you put some more water back in. What's happening is we have these pulses of groundwater discharge when wind comes through, and it reaches older water. So you can see here, this is saline, not just right at the seafloor, but going back some distance. And we have this depressed sea level for periods of days, older, more evolved, nutrient-rich, radium-rich 
we're not sure what else, Rich, water discharges. So this is a conceptual model with big arrows here showing this seawater exchange. And this was our geophysicist sprang to life last summer and showed, the, again, these confining layers. What we have is basically an old salt marsh that extends 10 to 12 kilometers offshore. And that's why we're seeing groundwater discharging 15 kilometers offshore. We didn't see groundwater discharging at those other wells that were only 10 kilometers offshore because they were cut off from this exchange by being either they were still in the unconfined aquifer or they were actually in this confining unit. So there just wasn't as much exchange. Um, next thing, it's new nitrogen. We've heard about, we've, we've been calling this recirculated seawater, but it's not just recirculated seawater. This first figure shows uh, the groundwater is in blue, the surface water is in gray, and the bottom water is in orange. And what you're seeing here is that the groundwater is highly enriched in uh, phosphate and in nitrogen compared to seawater, river water, all these other things. All right. So there's, first of all, there's a lot of uh, especially nitrogen. All right. And when we look at the N15 isotopes, uh, you can see that the groundwater is distinct from the seawater. So there, there's definitely a lot of new nitrogen. There's undoubtedly some component of recycled nitrogen, and we don't know how big that fraction is. We still need to work that out. But consider that this nitrogen is, came from nitrogen fixation from salt marshes however many thousands of years ago. Now sea level has risen, and we're exchanging some of that nitrogen and carbon and phosphorus. So undoubtedly, there is a, a large new component. All right, um, and we can finally believe, you've seen this figure before also, we can finally believe these budget numbers, right? Uh, the saline submarine groundwater discharge contributes about three times the contribution of rivers for DIN and DON, it's more like four times for DIP, right? But you've just seen my, my first try at that new conceptual model. This is not the conceptual model that's supplying this much uh, nitrogen or this much phosphorus, right? We need to step out and consider we have a stack of confined aquifers, and each one of them can be exchanging groundwater flow where they intersect the seafloor, right? So that's how we get so much flow. We stack up a bunch of aquifers. Each one of them can exchange a lot of water. All right, so is this something that humans can screw up? <laughs> So one question I get a lot is, what about groundwater extraction? If we pump a lot of water on land, will we mess up your exchange offshore? And to me, this is a self-limiting problem. If we uh, pump that much water in through the seafloor that we're stopping this two-way exchange, pretty soon you're going to have saltwater intrusion and you'll stop pumping. Self-limiting. OK, shipping channels. These are interesting. There was a big controversy when they were getting ready to deepen the shipping channel here at Charleston Harbor uh, because they were afraid they were going to cut the first confining unit. Yeah, Cantor remembers this from the day. It was a long time ago. All right, and all the, the rich people live right here, and they were concerned about that. All right, I don't know what ultimately happened with that, but if you cut a hole in that first confining unit, you can short circuit this process, at least in a first confined aquifer. I don't think we're going to short circuit it down below that because you'd have to cut pretty deep, and nobody likes to dig that deep in the ocean, except IODP. So, next one, sea level rise. Sea level rise, this is a lot, I, I think of this system a lot like beaches. Sea level moves back and forth across the continental shelf, and the beach moves back and forth across the continental shelf. This system also moves back and forth across the continental shelf. As long as there are confined aquifers and there's a sea floor and there's some land, you've got the hydraulic connection, you'll have this exchange. So we probably can't screw that up. Um, one that I've been thinking about is changes in upwelling and storms. And I recently read a paper that said that upwelling was going to definitely change one way or the other, and then I couldn't remember how. And then I Googled it, and it turns out it's not clear how. <laughs> But storms are definitely increasing in intensity, and that will increase the changes in sea level as a storm comes through. So there could be increases in this, but there's still a lot of things to check. 
Um, there are a lot of other things we don't know, but let me tell you my one other thing. I said I wanted to say two things. I'm going to say this very quickly. It has been hard to balance the major ion budgets of the ocean. And we're talking about calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium. Right? And um, so as long as I'm advocating for like a new arrow on the hydrologic cycle and a new arrow in chemical ocean budgets for groundwater, let's go big. So the idea here is that it's been hard to balance this budget because it's not clear where we get this calcium. So much carbonate is precipitating in the ocean. Where does all that calcium come from? All right, we have to get rid of potassium and magnesium. We haven't quite got that balanced. Um, as we see this new generation of isotope budgets for the ocean, uh, we were seeing new problems like, well, this says that we can't hide the magnesium in low temperature basalt alterations. We need some hidden dolomite to put it in, all right? I forgot to read the rest of it. Here's rivers, mid-ocean ridges, carbonate precipitation, and low temperature basalt alteration. So is there another thing? And my, my uh, belief is yes, there is. Um, this just came out this year. Um, what about groundwater flow through continental shelves? 80% of the sediments in the world are stored in continental shelves, slopes, and rises. And groundwater moves through these things, I know, because I did my PhD on it in, you know, the 90s. So this is a couple of flow systems that would explain this uh, geothermal convection. You don't need, it's not special high temperatures. It's just heat escaping from the center of the Earth. This happens every, the driving force for this exists in every continental shelf in the world, cold seawater next to warmer pore waters. Uh, this is sediment compaction. If you've ever heard about the cold seeps in the Gulf of Mexico or any other cold seeps, sediment compaction drives flow. Um, to be very brief, because I'm using up my time here, we picked representative basins. We picked resident, uh, uh, representative, representative fluid compositions. Uh, the fluids in sedimentary basins fall on a spectrum. So pick the spectrum. Um, and these common reactions move the budget in the right direction. Okay, so I, there's math. It works out. Um, this is a good contributor, and it can give us an idea of what contributions would be needed from low temperature basalt alteration, and it comes out consistent with field observation. The last thing I want to say is this can contribute to the secular variation in, sea, in ocean water chemistry. All right, think about times when we didn't have a lot of continental shelves. The trough here, there's a peak here, right? Um, also, when sea level is low, you get less geothermal convection through continental shelves because less of them are below sea level, All right? So these things could be uh, very much, they are consistent with uh, these changes that we've seen in ocean chemistry. So since I've used up all my time, the short answer is, need some more arrows on all these budgets. Again. Perfect. Um, maybe a couple of questions for Alicia, but I also want to say thank you for coming here because you were the 2023 Darcy Distinguished Lecturer and you took over 30 trips last year. So I really appreciate that you also uh, are here in person. I got to talk to oceanographers. <laughs> it was great. And you can tell I'm all about which way the water moves. I need to collaborate to figure out what's in it. So I would love to collaborate. Great. Uh, one or two questions for Dr. Wilson and then we'll reconvene the panel. Uh, <clears throat> Masha Papapenko, Pomona College. Are there evidence for dolomite formation in these wedges? Do people find them act actually, actual dolomite? That, that was, that's been one of the things that's been holding people up. It's like, where's dolomite precipitating in the modern world? It's precipitating inside every carbonate platform and also in, uh, in classic uh, continental shells. It's just it's inside where we can't see it. But we know that it's happening because seawater is moving through at higher temperatures where dolomitization occurs. 
yeah, that's what we've been missing. I'm like, it's not hidden dolomite. Yeah, we can't see it. But <laughs> any other questions? So, uh, Jerry Wigert, University of Southern Mississippi. First, I want to comment when you asked the audience if the humans can mess it up, let them answer for you. Um, Good idea. So, the other thing, like, you know, the, with the wells sort of interspersed and trying to figure out where things are happening, how much can you then say, okay, well, I know for the reasons you talked about where things are happening, how can you? How easy is it to extrapolate it to the full area of this working? Ah, yeah. The issue is that we really have bad information about the hydrogeography of continental shelves globally. Um, we know from onshore, you can look at all the USGS reports, and you can see all the stacked aquifers going up, walking up the east coast, right? So we can extrapolate that they go offshore. Um, but yeah, it's difficult to say. Uh, Billy Moore is, has been working in South Africa with Claudia Benitez Nelson, and I can't remember their collaborator there, where they've been seeing uh, hypoxia during upwelling events. We've, we've started to collect, Billy has started to collect uh, hints from other places. There's another place offshore Africa where they see um, strange geochemistry that suggests this happening. But, yeah, I have a grad student who did the math. He found some kind of global database about the thickness of, I'm going to have to look it up. We can estimate. But it's a huge frontier. Hi, um, thanks for the great talk. Um, this is Julia Moriarty from uh, CU Boulder. And um, I was curious, so sort of building off of Jerry's question, if we had maps of like the um, you know, where the aquifers are. It also, on most continental shelves, you also have this layer of mud that covers most of the shelf and is often cohesive. And so, to what extent does that um, also limit, do you have an idea of how, like, I, it seems to me that would also limit where groundwater is coming out, but would that make sense to you? And Yeah, when you have that kind of mud layer, that certainly is going to cut down on things. Where the exchange will be is where there are holes. But, I mean, so, so my oceanography comes from, like, textbooks people handed down or, like, just osmosis by talking to oceanographers. Um, I, my understanding is that about 60% of the continental shelves in the world are these sandy sediments, which spawned the whole permeable sediments Gordon Conference there for a while. Um, so those are the shelves we're looking for. But I know, as I travel around and talk to people in Oregon, they're like, it's metamorphic rocks. So I was like, okay, it's going to be different for you. Yeah, geology, geology does matter, I guess. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Uh, Megan and Craig, maybe you could come up and we could start our panel. Uh, May is pulling up Nils and Joe online. <clears throat> We've also put up some discussion topics. These are some of the brainstorms that we had to start off discussion uh, about some of the things that we would like to see happen, but also other questions like how do we develop new technologies, uh, as Megan brought up, to actually monitor some of the things that we might want to monitor. We had an online question, I think, from earlier. Oh, happy. Okay. Okay, so they had a discussion offline. So some of the discussion topics that we were concerned about where um, a shitty impacts on carbon budgets, DOC, DIC, alkalinity, methane. We're also interested in nutrient and uh, trace element and isotope fluxes. 
what that does to elemental budgets in the ocean. And then someone had already asked this question about paleo implications, like what happens with sea level rise, um, with uh, extended retreat of glaciers, and how does that also uh, impact uh, the interpretation of our proxy records? Um, <clears throat> and then finally, as I had already mentioned, uh, technological innovations. What type of technology do we need to develop to actually detect the things we need to detect, to differentiate source signatures, et cetera? Yes. Uh, Julie Granger, UConn. Uh, this question is for Susan. So uh, in looking at the data, when you had an upwelling event, you had a, a very small change in temperature of the water. But then was this the region where you also saw lower oxygen? And it, or those, that was a different region? That was a different place. Uh, okay. Yeah, I didn't do a good job showing you the map. I would, our, our well field was offshore of Charleston. Uh, Billy's event was in Winya Bay, about, if you drive, about an hour north. And then just north of that is, is Long Bay with Myrtle Beach. And that's where they have those fish kills. So I guess my question is, is what volume of submarine groundwater discharges in these events? And what kind of area could it impact? The area is large. If you compare um, tide gauges going up the shoreline, if you've looked at that kind of thing, they aren't very different between tide gauges. There are slight differences, but we're talking about hundreds of kilometers of the shoreline. And from the radium budgets in the South Atlantic Bight, that was the first place we found that the volume that's over the year uh, was about equal to river discharge. The volume in any, a given event is think of, if you think about just like piston flow, how much water travels vertically. Um, over the course of the year, about a meter or two. So think of that discharging in five or six events that are shorter. Uh, Jim Moffat from USC. Do these areas tend to be hot spots for um, uh, biological life, you know, bioturbation, burrowing worms, that kind of thing? We really, really wanted, uh, the work with Jay Pinckney was to see if we could see a correlation between groundwater discharge and uh, the biomass of benthic microalgae. And the short answer is we couldn't tell. Um, the, the ocean in this area is generally very well mixed, and this is very shallow. I mean, my well field is from 6 to 15 meters of water depth so we could access it with um, divers. So most of the time you just can't tell. Um, certainly, the volume of nutrients, Jay did the math, he has a, it's called a mini review of something, I think 2017, 2018. The amount of nitrogen that discharges from the seafloor in the South Atlantic Bight is 40 to 70 percent of the amount of nitrogen needed to feed the benthic microalgae, which are the base of the food chain. We couldn't prove that they were actually eating it. I think it's, everything's so well mixed, we wouldn't be able to tell. I wonder if uh, any of the other panelists have also noticed, just to follow up on Jim's question, you noticed, I, I think Neil showed a, a figure of uh, the spring versus the control, but I'm wondering if you all also have seen uh, these other indicators. So, so you know, acutely, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Neil. I think, I think um, we, we have seen that there is places where we saw more marine life close to close to submarine springs, for instance, and also and also seeps at the beach, that goes from fish to algae to um, biota. But for instance, in the um, in the intertidal area of the German One Sea, I know of a study that actually showed the exact absence of worms. Um, so you could basically spot submarine uh, groundwater discharge just based on the absence of those worm burrows on the top of them, uh, on the top of the sediment. So I think it's really depending on the actual situation at each individual location. Yeah, I was going to say, so locally, sometimes we see, um, you know, algae just growing directly on where the nitrogen is coming out, especially um, in the coastal embayments here. But thinking about coral specifically, 
it really depends on if your SGD is coming out um, and is acidifying. Um, some SGD can actually help um, uh, with the, the CO2 system because some of the, it's the more alkalinity is coming out than DIC. And it really depends on what reaction is going on and where it is and what aquifer lithology is. Um, and in those cases, we've seen some places where corals actually won't grow around springs, and then we've seen some places where corals will grow around springs. Um, and then, like, anecdotally, um, a sampling off of the Yucatan, um, there's definitely huge springs all over out there, and you would see, um, you would actually observe wildlife there. Um, I don't know if anybody's actually quantified it, like Nils showed, but I think that stuff is actually a little hard to quantify unless you're observing it constantly. I'll follow up on <clears throat> what Megan's saying and just note that you know, anecdotally, when you go to these field sites, if you have the opportunity to talk to fishermen or people who are working these shorelines, they're often the first to know exactly where these seeps are occurring. The chances are they're looking in these locations, oftentimes because there's more productivity in these regions. That's a great All right, that's better. Okay, um, we we have done some flyovers of some of the lagoons and haven't identified like cold water seeps. Um, and uh, but these systems are very productive. Like the shallow estuaries in, Ala in northern Alaska are very productive. There's lots of macroinvertebrates, fish species, small and large. Um, but I think that's a definitely an interesting and open-ended question: is if there are hot spots for a freshwater or, or uh, groundwater inflow or just um, hot spots of saline or recirculated groundwater, do we see those areas more productive than others? I think great proposal. Uh, hi, yeah, this is Kara Manning from the University of Connecticut. Um, so I spent about half of my postdoc kind of learning about groundwater and I feel like one of the like barriers to exchange is kind of just like the different vocabulary and very different techniques that are used for sampling. And so like, if you were to ask this room, like raise your hand, if you could install a piezometer, probably like I would, and a few of us would, but like, you know, yeah, yay, piezometers. But um, <laughs> I didn't know what a piezometer was, right? Um, so I'm just curious, like what you think could be helpful for enhancing more interdisciplinary research, like whether like a summer schools would be useful or like more interdisciplinary graduate training programs um, for all levels of like scientists who want to get more involved in groundwater research or groundwater scientists who want to understand the ocean side more. Um, and the models too, right? The models don't talk to each other either, right? There's groundwater models and there's ocean circulation models and like, yeah, so any thoughts would be interest, of interest to me. That is a really good question. I had a PhD student come in, Jacob, you saw some of his work, and he had never coded before. And, um, and the first thing on his first day, took home a pump and took it apart and told us why it had broken and uh, put it back together and then it worked. And then that first week, he took home the way we had been monitoring temperature below the seafloor, completely re redesigned it and built a prototype in his garage. And then he learned to code and built temperature or light sensors that would let us tell, like, it was just a stack of light sensors in a transparent tube that if you see light, you're above the seafloor, and if you don't, you're below the seafloor. And that let us finally track where our sensors were relative to the seafloor, so we can now track that benthic exchange, right? And those were skills that I did not teach him. But they really changed how we were able to operate on the seafloor. Um, and we did not dive. We just hand things to divers and, right? So um, I'm going to have to think about, I, I would be happy to do a field school installing physometers, but this <laughs> offshore stuff and getting grad students who can do that challenge. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll make a small plug for the Cactophic Oceanography Program, which I've been involved in or was involved in for a few years. This is northeastern Alaska. Um, and uh, the University of Texas was running a K-12 program out of there for a while. 
Um, and um, we would work with the local community and the children. And, and I did take piezometers out there and, and install them. It was, it was very easy, very simple to just be able to stick them, you know, in the shallow ground and, and pump some groundwater off and made for a really great teaching moment. So even something simple and be able to explain just the concept of, hey, there's water that's flowing on top of this permafrost and it's making its way into these streams and we can see it and we can quantify it. Um, seem really seem really powerful to me. And I'll make a comment in, in terms of like core curriculum for oceanography departments. I don't know how many of your departments that have a geological oceanography program actually have a unit on SGD or hydrogeology in that class. But you know, in terms of breaking down barriers to terms that Kara's mentioned here, like what is SGD or saline and fresh, a lot of that can be done for graduate students in the classroom to start. I think building upon field programs is a, a bigger question to tackle, but a lot of it can be alleviated to start in the classroom. Yeah, I, I would add that I think a, a summer school around the coast could actually be a really interesting venue because coming from, I'm, I'm a terrestrial hydrogeologist, so I, I came to the coast by land, basically, um, or from land. And it's really interesting to see how many hydrogeologists actually don't really think about what groundwater could do in the ocean. While at the same time, they say, of course, it goes there. But I don't care as long as my groundwater doesn't get cell and I, I don't get cell water intrusion into my aquifer. So, um, and I think really bringing the marine scientists and the terrestrial scientists together right at the coast could be ben very beneficial for both sides at some point. But yeah, that will be one more, one more summer school and who to do it, when to do it, that will be a different question on how to do it. But actually that really is a great suggestion because you could get, I mean, you can install pathometers, you could do the hydrology. I'm thinking you go out to a salt marsh, a beach, the Wadden Sea, and, um, but then it's getting the geochemistry on top of it. And that's where I would like, for example, to tackle that question of the residence time and the different sort of evolution of the different fluids with longer residence times. Let's do it in a salt marsh instead of 15 kilometers offshore. It's just a lot easier. There are a lot of um, SGD folks who have their favorite sites where they actually have infrastructure that might be permanently put in place. And it would be a lot easier for them to get a water sediment or other sample and then share it with somebody who had a novel expertise or a novel chemical thing. So I guess I would say for that, reach out to, you know, your you know Google SGD in an area you're interested in. And, and those folks usually have samples. I know I just talked to somebody over lunch and they were talking about expanding the alkalinity um, knowledge of, of the world's rivers and they were just like going around and asking everybody they knew who were in rivers to like take a sample for them. I think you could do that with SGD scientists too. All right, Drew Chapel, USF. Um, so this is sort of related to that question. And it, I know that uh, Alicia, uh, you know, you're in Billy Moore's uh, offshore wells are pretty rare and uh, you know, like Chris Smith has it at um, USGS as well. But there are very few places where someone has taken the effort and, you know, it's tough, especially in an area where a hurricane comes through and then your well disappears, right? So I'm also not a geologist at all, but I'm guessing that there are differences in terms of where confining aquifers might be expected to be and how, what type of different, you know, along the West Florida shelf, thanks to Joe, we had a beautiful map of like which ones are expected to come out where, right? So where would be places that you think it would be really important to, to add to what you guys have both on the in, on passive margins to try and see if the same patterns that you're seeing with uh, sea level rise exist and are contributing SGD the, with those nutrient signatures along, you know, further up the coast and passive margins and places like that? Yeah, that's been something, um, I think, from some point of view, just showing that it happens more than just in the South Atlantic Bight where we have so much data would be a useful thing. Um, I have a friend in Delaware. I know people at Rutgers. I know you now. Um, there are plenty of other passive margins. I mean, we have the same data gap. I mean, the, 
the, we don't have anything in South America, well, very little in South America and very little in Africa. Um, it would be worth looking at sort of any one of those continental shelves. Yeah, passive margin around the part of it. Um, the other question I have is what happens during the winter? Yeah, yeah, I didn't mention that during my talk, did I? We just haven't had good data. We didn't have the light sensors in. It was a mess. And we need, we need, I need to get another grant. <laughs> Great. Um, hi, Bonnie Chang um, from Hourglass Climate. My question is for Megan. Um, you showed that case study in Hong Kong. And I was interested that, um, I, I don't know if I missed this, but did you explain why um, the pH and I think the CO2 changed so much, but you didn't see that in the salinity. So it was like, not advection, but then what do you think, or what was the explanation for that, that it changed so much so deeply? Yeah, that wasn't um, my study, but what they posited was that it was due to an influx of more oxygenated water, so they were actually pumping a little bit on the terrestrial head due to that. And so they really thought it was due to oxygen, and then it was respiration was driving the pH down, and then that cascades through the, the carbonate system with re-equilibration. So it was really the oxygen was coming in with the, the fresh groundwater, and so there was a very slight movement of the, of the salinity mixing zone, and so it just, the fresh water was turning over, and you couldn't see that as a change in salinity, but it was turning over and bringing more oxidants in, it was driving more reactions, and that was what was driving some of that. So it's one of the things where that's why you have a billion different things plotted together to try to create that story together. But it was actually coming in with both, but at that particular spot, because that was really focused in on the freshwater zone. Uh, Nathan Hall from UNC Chapel Hill. This question is for Alicia. Um, I'm really right. Oh, oh there. Yeah, Thank sorry. You. Right <laughs> I'm like. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm curious the mechanisms for the oxygen hypoxic episode associated with the submarine groundwater discharge. Is it was it like? Reduced species coming up and then, okay, is that it? Yeah, that's what, what were the reduced species then, I guess? That... I, um, I can't remember who had it, but they had um, Moore and Joy, the 20, I can't remember which paper. The latest thing that Billy's all interested in is that, first of all, the groundwater is hypoxic below the seafloor. Um, and then when it comes out, not only does it not have any oxygen, in it, but it also has all these reduced species that have a further man. That's what he's really interested in right now. And I'm a really bad geochemist. <laughs> uh, Maria Prokopenko, Pomona College. I have a question for Nils. Uh, you showed the global fluxes of uh, discharge, and I noticed there was a very high flux uh, coming out from Iceland. And uh, so I'm curious in this context about the contribution of iron coming from this discharge, because it's all basaltic rocks. So do you have any, do you know of any studies which looked at the contribution of iron from Iceland to this fluxes? Um. So in, in general, the, the reason, and you're, you're right, Iceland is a, an absolute hotspot on that map, and I'm still fascinated by it. The, the explanation for that is indeed that basalt or volcanic rock has a fairly high permeability attributed in the map. And you have, as long as you have enough precipitation and a high enough permeability, you get lots of SGD in this map or fresh SGD. For Iceland, I don't know a single field study, honestly, from there. I'd be really curious if that actually turns out to be true. From other volcanic islands, I know some field studies, actually some field studies, actually one of them drew me to um, the SGD field in general. That was won by Herdes Schopka in 2012 from Big Island in Hawaii, where she showed, I think that 10 times as much water leaves Big Island ground uh, as groundwater than as river water. So I think, I'm not sure if the number holds, but to me it was very intriguing. And um, so I think basaltic islands are, are, are prone to be hotspots of SGD. 
I'll just comment that uh, Isaac Santos's group is doing a regional scale SGD study along the coast of Iceland, and Shoyli and myself are doing some more local scale studies. Cool. Cool. Is it is the SGD coming out of that? Uh, that's a question for Isaac. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I have a follow-up high latitude question, if I could just talk to Mike. I think this is for Craig, but really maybe for all of you. So when I think about um, seasonality in the Arctic, uh, you, you know, you talked about uh, what was the old conceptual model and then maybe what is more the new conceptual model of how uh, the extent of permafrost and how much of the ground is actually frozen. Do you consider, uh, a, how would you consider this, uh, putting together a conceptual model for regions that also have sea ice. So, I mean, do uh, what would the timing, or what would you expect the timing to be of the breakup of sea ice and its connection maybe to water movement through parts of the permafrost then on land that is thawing or has some connectivity with that lagoon? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, Kind of, I guess, off the top of my head, um, think about the system as it changes from spring to summer and summer over open water period. During the during spring, around May, June, right now, the, the ice is is still melting. The sea ice is still melting. Is still thawing. During that that spring freshet pulse, kind of helps to start push things away. But a lot of that fresh water just spills on top of the sea ice. So it takes it takes a little bit of time for that sea ice to melt. And until so. There isn't um, what I would expect very much of any wind-driven uh, SGD going on in the shallow coast. So that's right. As it's really when the sea ice uh, retreats uh, and the open water period starts is when you start seeing that wind-driven SGD. Um, now, in thinking about thawing permafrost, I guess that's a, a that maybe a better question is to think about salinity changes and um, how that might change the um, the ability for that permafrost to thaw. So I can kind of see a scenario where when it is an open water period and when we do see, um, we, we expect to see higher sea level rise moving forward and if we have wind-driven um, currents that are pushing that water more and more show, or closer to shore, that will <clears throat> kind of interact and, and uh, allow for the, that permafrost that would be uh, <clears throat> underneath the beach or maybe might, might be uh, more inland to start thawing. And so I think there is Potential for both the combination of um, saltwater intrusion and then also with a longer open season to amplify permafrost thaw in the summer. Uh, Colette Kelly, who had a question for Megan. So your incredible diagram of all the reactions was missing nitrous oxide, and I was wondering, has anybody measured SGD drip and nitrous oxide fluxes? I think yes, but not a lot. Um, and that wasn't my diagram. That was from a, a review of microbial processes, but I don't know why they wouldn't be there. Um, no, that's what I know, but Joe might know more. Uh, Caitlin Young, who's at Stony Brook University, she did some nitrous oxide cycling in the subterranean estuary. And then Isaac Santos, uh, who's got his fingerprints on everything, has done some of that as well. I was curious about the role of events and some inter the interactions between like the chemistry and um, hydrology. And so like in um, like for when I think about river discharge and discharge of chemicals to the ocean, often at times when you have events, the concentrations actually dip because um, it's sort of all this water coming down, but there's not necessarily um, like the chemistry can't keep up. You sort of lose some of that supply of nutrients and um, things that are coming down river. And I was curious if this sort of, I don't think the data is there. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But like if you were to observe a time series of the chemistry during some of these events or after some of these events, what you might think you see. Like would you expect the concentrations to be stable? Would you expect them to... Um, sort of dip like rivers, or is there just so much supply that it really depends on how much flow is coming out? Are you thinking of the surface water or the groundwater? I was thinking of the groundwater, or both. Fair enough. 
I think one of the most important questions for this whole thing is how big the mixing zone is below the sediment water interface, whether you're going into a salt marsh or into the seafloor or exchanging in the Arctic, because um, those compositions change as you go through. And they change on short time scales. We thought we could take, I mean, back in the early 2000s, it's like, let's get the radium activity for this end member for the groundwater. And then we were staked out at Tidal Creek for 24 hours, and the radium activities changed as the tide went in and out. Um, plus, there was artifacts left over from the, just the wind event that had driven groundwater into the whole thing and then back out again the previous week. There's a big mixing zone. That's a, a really important question. I think thinking about if the water flow is, is going faster than the, I mean, from a carbon standpoint, is, is the water flowing faster than the carbon can be produced in the subsurface? They, you know, this is maybe an end member because this is an organic rich salt marsh where there's poor water exchanging, there's groundwater bringing in that carbon out to the estuary, but we have mostly a complete time series of about five years. And there's only one episode in that entire five years where it looks like uh, we, we ran out of carbon to flow. Um, and so I, at least in that circumstance from that, the question, and that may be not how you intended the question, but that's how I think about when I think about carbon exclusively. I think we, I think we need to wrap up. So uh, I really want to thank all our panelists. I know I called out Alicia for traveling here after, you know, doing her 35th or 38th trip in the last uh, 15 months. But I really want to thank all of our panelists for joining us for this session. Uh, I want to thank Heather, May, and Mary for helping us put this together, and also the OCBSSC for supporting this session. So thanks very much.